find it. Good morning and welcome to Alaska DOT's U.S. Peer Exchange webinar. I'm Rob. I'll be moderating today's presentation. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Please shut off your VPNs and background apps. Uh, this increases our bandwidth ability to play videos as well as maximize your viewing experience of today's presentations. All attendees today are currently muted. There are two ways to participate. Use the question box to ask a question uh, or indicate that you have a question. And two, raise your hand to be unmuted. Once you will still have to unmute yourself. If you called in by phone, make sure you've entered your audio pin so that you have the ability to participate. Uh, and if you happen to lose your control panel, use the orange minimum button. And with that, I'd like to welcome Kathleen Graber, Deputy Division Administrator with the Federal Administration, Alaska Division. Kathleen, it's all yours. Morning, Ryan. I actually just lost your audio. Are you still there? No. When, where did I cut out? At? Oh, I was trying to actually shut off my VPN, so <laughs> I don't know. But you, had, I heard you introduce me, so I can go ahead and get started. How does that sound? Oh, here, I think I got it off my... Uh, let's try that. I think I got the entry beeps on, so can you hear me now? I can, yes. Perfect. Did I miss out on all of the, the VPN stuff at the beginning? Nope, I heard that. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, again, thank you, Ryan, and good morning to everyone. On Tuesday, Ryan gave a brief presentation to the division, the Alaska division, and the DOT leadership about highlights of the UAS program at DOT. And we were very impressed with everything that is happening. We saw examples of enhanced bridge inspections to flyovers of the Sterling Highway project, where data from that can be used to help move the project forward in different ways. So again, we were very impressed with that. Federal Highways has been promoting the use of UAS in different ways. In particular, our Everyday Counts 5 or EDC 5 initiative that started a couple years ago was to promote further deployment of UAS at state DOTs and other stakeholders. So we supported that effort and it was Troy LaRue who initiated the action plan for the DOT. And then when Ryan came on board, I know he got involved. Another effort that we have supported is the project that Ryan and the Bridge Design Group applied for this past year for stick incentive funding. So that is the Alaska State Transportation Innovation Council awards up to $100,000 every year to support further deployment or statewide deployment of a proven innovation. So this year we awarded that funding to the project that the the, that Ryan and the Bridge Design Group put forth, which is streamlining infrastructure monitoring at with UAS. And then last year, Ryan also was awarded a small pot of funding for this peer exchange. And while I know it was initially intended to be in person at the end of March, I'm so glad that he and whoever else has been working on this was able to transition that to this virtual environment. While I know the ability to have the demonstrations and other, other hands-on activities will have to be delayed for now. At least this information sharing opportunity will be able to continue. And I'm sure from having seen what we've seen so far from the DOT that there will be many ideas that will be put forth during this peer exchange. At the Tuesday meeting, one of the concepts that came up was using drone data to further the asset management models. And another idea that has that is being put forth for the EDC6 round, which will be launched 
very soon and start in January is for the Traffic Incident Management Innovation, which is coming back as an innovation that has been an EDC before, but now we're looking at supporting additional tools. And one of those, you won't be surprised to hear, is the use of drones for traffic incident management. So clearly there's a lot of there's a lot going on at the DOT already. And there are so many great possibilities for how we can use this technology. The challenge might be to actually prioritize and figure out where you want to devote your resources. But there's so much great work going on. We're very excited about that. We look forward to supporting any way we can. And we look forward to hearing more about the positive results. So thank you again, Ryan. And I look forward to this peer exchange. Thank you, Kathleen. Next, I'd like to introduce John Bender, Deputy Commissioner of Alaska DOT, and Troy LaRue, Division Operations Manager for Statewide Aviation here with DOT. Hello, everybody. This is John Bender, uh, primarily in charge of the aviation system for the state of Alaska. I, I know we've got uh, a lot of DOTs nationwide uh, on today. And uh, just to provide a little bit of perspective, uh, State of Alaska is the largest airport sponsor in the country. We've currently got 239 airports that we own and operate across the state. Um, you're well aware that Alaska is big, uh, but uh, what you may not know is approximately 82% of our communities in Alaska are not on the road system. So we rely, depend solely on aviation for their connectivity. Um, that brings a lot of challenges to us, not only the distance involved, but uh, the different weather patterns and uh, minimal staffing we have to cover that. Uh, that vast region, and that's really where UAS comes in, provides some great opportunities for us. Um, so really excited for what will be covered today. I appreciate everybody's patience as we've worked to put this peer exchange together. I know we've been working uh, at it for several months here. Uh, definitely want to throw out a big thank you to FHWA for the uh, funding and being able to put this together for us. We appreciate your partnership and, and support there as we put a an effort like this together that allows us to collaborate and work together uh, really well beyond state lines there and take advantage of the opportunities, lessons learned that folks are having across the country. Also want to express our appreciation to ask Joe. I know uh, Shane Gill is uh, involved here as well. Shane, appreciate your efforts with the Aviation Council and uh, a lot of the synergies we're gaining there between uh, different aviation organizations. Do you want to just encourage everybody to uh, you know, participate today, get lots of collaboration going there. You know, uh, this opportunity for us to link a lot of technologies that are seeming to come together and providing a lot of safeties and efficiencies to, to each of us there as we grow our programs. Uh, Ryan, I appreciate your leadership, uh, what you're doing with our program here, and I'll hand over to, to Troy LaRue. Thanks, John. Good morning. This is Troy LaRue. Welcome to Alaska. Sorry, this is as close as most of you are going to get this year, but I'm elated that we're still able to host this peer exchange. Special thank you to our friends at, at FHWA. I, I just, I'm, I'm glad that you're supporting these peer exchanges across the country and we're glad to be able to participate. UAS is changing our focus. It's increasing safety, efficiencies, and adding so many new resources to our toolbox. I'm glad that you guys have joined us. I've never witnessed networking at a national level like what's taking place with unmanned systems. This is the fastest growing industry that we've ever experienced and it wouldn't have the momentum or synergy that we've harnessed today without information sharing like you guys are participating in. Please enjoy the peer exchange, ask questions, strive to meet new professional contacts. A special thank you again to FHWA and to my good friend, Paul Wheeler from Utah and Orion, who's taken our UAS team to new altitudes here in Alaska. Really hope you guys enjoy this time. Thank you, guys. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our amazing lineup today of uh, UAS innovators, starting with Paul Wheeler with Utah DOT, Mark uh, Hillsketter with Anchorage Police Department, Jake Sloan with JS Media, Aaron Mason with Municipal Light and Power, Amber McDonald with Indemnus, and Nick Adkins with Alaska Center for Unmanned Systems Integration. Our uh, tentative agenda today, uh, of course, we have State of UAS here starting in uh, at 9.15, followed by our U.S. Innovator presentations. Uh, with that, uh, after, or after that, an interactive 
question and answer discussion. So all of the questions that you guys have, please be putting those into the chat box uh, and then wrap, in, or wrap up there before noon. So uh, just a reminder, FHWA and Alaska do not endorse any of the products, softwares or services mentioned during today's presentation. Uh, and with that, I'll start us off with Alaska DOT's UAS program. Alaska DOT is split into three regions to better support our rural communities and, and 492 airport runways. Uh, with 82% of our communities not being served by the road system, aviation remains the only means of transportation. In 2016, our northern region spearheaded using UAS and, and really built the foundation for us to expand operations uh, to where we're at here today. This year, we've had just over 600 flights spanning across the entire state. Uh, and as the graphic shows for scale, that's operations from Florida all the way to California. Alaska DOT has 38 remote pilots and 34 aircraft throughout the state with DJI, GoPro, and SenseFly aircraft being our primary platforms. This information is available through the use of the low altitude authorization and notification capability or LANS for short. Uh, and this is a graphic I put together just to show how limited Alaska's physical and, and wire, uh, wireless infrastructure really is um, and showing how far we have deployed U.S. technologies across the entire state uh, as a solution for really doing more with less. You can see our roadways, airports, um, our ADSB coverage um, and satellite coverage, which is something a lot of the, the rest of the world doesn't deal with, with satellite forecasting for operations. Uh, this also includes cell coverage. Um, both with our, our two primary um, providers up here. Uh, and so it's very interesting when we, when we overlay that, that we have UAS systems operating in these areas with zero connectivity. Airspace safety is a top priority for us. And as we begin to integrate UAS into our everyday operations, we're making sure it's well known where we're operating at, as well as being included um, as part of our public safety campaigns. And uh, there are some ways we're getting the information out. Of course, NOTAMs, uh, we're really starting to look into using TFRs when we have operations above 400 feet, um, VHF radio, so our CTAF broadcast every 10 minutes, um, ADSB monitoring. We're, we're looking into systems uh, that work in these, in these environments, uh, the iPad apps, um, the ability to track traffic uh, with these mobile devices from the ground. Of course, airport signage, uh, working with the FAST team to host annual US safety webinars, uh, with our known operations, uh, social media, magazine articles, uh, and then partnering with aviation advocacy, advocacy groups here in Alaska. Uh, and lastly, uh, updating our DOT web map, uh, as well as flight planning apps like what you see here with Sky Vector uh, showing our current NOTAMs. Now I wanted to highlight a unique project that we've been using UAS to do all of our survey mapping, as well as monitoring the entire project. Uh, so far, this project has been designed uh, and is being built with data collected from just UAS alone. Uh, this is the Sterling Highway milepost 45 through 60, uh, which is also known as the Cooper Landing uh, Bypass Project. Uh, estimated completion, of course, is 2025, and estimated cost is about $400 million. Uh, with a distance of about 14 miles, we're really learning on uh, how we use UAS to effectively monitor, capture data, uh, and, and facilitate our design surveys. Now in 2019, we did our initial LIDAR collection uh, here with one of the systems. For any of you that are uh, like tech specs, uh, this is with a DJI M600 uh, and a Velodyne Puck. Uh, and so we did the initial LIDAR acquisition as well as imagery using the same platform with a phase one camera. Um, and so that imagery and that data really set the, the ability for us to have that DEM uh, and the project deliverables um, as, as we moved into the survey and design phase. Now with that, uh, after we started clearing, uh, we started using the Phantom RTK systems for collecting imagery updates of our, of our vegetation clearing, uh, as well as our SenseFly EB. Uh, now this is using uh, the system we, sh we showed before with the ADS-B in, where we can actually show uh, air traffic as it's coming into our working area. Um, and so this is one of the safety features that we definitely have been testing out and validating um, as we're operating in these areas uh, that we have known air traffic operations. Um, and with some of the other uh, presentations here today, you'll see a lot with structure from motion um, and, and capturing in these high vegetation areas. So you can see what's unique about the EB is we can collect not only um, nadir imagery, but oblique imagery 
all within the same flight line. Now, this has been a big advancement when we have dense areas uh, with vegetation. Uh, as you can see, it allows for us to rebuild those solely based off structure for motion and not LIDAR. Um, one of the big assets for us is visualization. Uh, this is one. Of, this will be the largest bridge, single uh, single span bridge here in Alaska, um, 700 to 800 feet long and about 200 feet above the canyon. Uh, we are using the 3D point cloud as well as our triangle mesh to load the 3D model in. Uh, so we really are going to get a first look at what this bridge looks like here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and you can see the the aerial clearing efforts here. Uh, this photo was taken here about two weeks ago. Now with that. The, the data that we are creating, we are sharing that with a wide audience. Uh, so we're using an online web map uh, to, to house and, as well as showcase our project imagery, our 3D files. Uh, and this really allows for our team, project team members and designers, as well as our engineers, to have everything in one place, um, as well as our public outreach, as we're showing what our status is with these projects and, and having it all in one place has definitely proven to be a big benefit to us. Some interesting projects that DOT has been working on. Uh, this is the Kuskokwim Ice Road. Uh, there's a picture down there on the right where uh, I like to show it was a nice sunny day at about 20 to 30 below zero. Um, so I'm wearing two parkas. And uh, with that, our iPads probably lasted about five minutes. But um, with this, we're showing that we can actually collect measurements for seasonal roads. Um, so using structure for motion, and, and this is uh, one of the efforts DOT is working with with the University of Alaska Fairbanks on creating design and engineering guidelines for some of our ice roads. Now, I mentioned that we manage about 234 airports throughout the state, um, of which we have to charter flights to get a majority of our teams out there. So this is where we're using UAS to really change the way we we inspect and manage our, our airport facilities, as well as verify compliance. So with a lot of this data, our ability to verify that we don't have any Part 77 encroachments, uh, runway conditions, and really jump... Hello? Oh, and really jumping into our uh, machine learning. So the ability for us to see um, and, and document and, and really use this technology to investigate cracking um, and, and verifying um, our, our pavement conditions. So you can see down here, this is a traditional delivery result that we'll get with from our pavement group. And so we're, we're testing the difference between using machine learning as well as figuring out how we grade those pavement condition indexes. Uh, we are using them for rockfall mitigation. If, for, for a lot of you here at DOT, you probably saw the video that we filmed uh, flying out over the water from a safe distance, but documenting this blasting, uh, as well as our avalanche crews. MNO is using these systems uh, to document where they deliver ordnance uh, and, and is clearing efforts as well. I always like to show some of the other cool projects uh, this spring, we had the opportunity to work with NOAA uh, and the National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, as well as U.S. Fish and Wildlife on a stuck baby gray whale in the 20 Mile River. Uh, we, collect, we, we successfully collected about eight snot samples over the period of about four flights. Uh, and this was something that uh, we had done in the past with, with some of the snot bot systems, but very unique in the ability for us to respond instantly with these systems um, and, and help NOAA out. And as the last item, uh, really today is all about connecting resources. And we really wanted to make sure everyone's aware um, of what DOT is doing with our online resources and how to operate UAS uh, in Alaska safely. Uh, if you do have any questions, um, feel free to check that out and, and let me know. Otherwise, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and jump over to Paul Wheeler with Utah DOT. Hello, good morning, everyone. Excited to be here. Thank you for the information, the uh, invitation to be here. I'm quite honored. So it's exciting for me to, to talk about what we're doing in, in Utah and, and hopefully share some of that information about some of the lessons learned that we've had in mapping and, and doing other things. And uh, hopefully you guys can learn from our mistakes and uh, and not have to make the same ones. So let's see with that, if you can just advance to the next slide for me. Yeah, let me see if I can. Uh, I'm gonna okay. see if I can just give you uh, control. Oh, you cannot take control. All right, I got it. Okay, perfect. All right. 
So uh, Utah, kind of like Alaska, we're we're pretty diverse in what we have in our state. As you can see here, here's the salt flats. Anybody that watched Pirates of the Caribbean or many other movies, they tend to like to use this for <laughs> their backdrop in there. Also, this is the Bonneville Speedway. So we have anything from here to our mountainous forested areas down to our Red Rock Desert. So it, it creates a lot of different issues that we have with heat, with cold, with different environments, uh, exposure in other areas. So it's uh, quite diverse, as such as I hear Alaska is as well. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to visit up there yet, but uh, just seen pictures, talked to Troy quite a bit, and uh, it seems like you guys have a lot of the same problems that we have. When I talk to other colleagues that are from uh, the eastern side of the U.S., they just don't have mountains like we do, and uh, it creates some unique situations for us with winds, with elevation, with terrain following, and that's what I hope to kind of share with that. Uh, if you go on to the next slide, I'll just share kind of where we started, where we're at, and then see, um, oh, I, I transferred control over to you, so see if you can hit it. Oh, perfect. Oh, yep. I've got control. Yep, I got it. Thanks. All right. So with that, uh, we kind of started back in 2010, just testing out some of the technology with one of our local universities there. If you're interested, there's a link to the full report on what we did, but we tested some multispectral items with vegetation and others to see if uh, the sensors were actually working what they, they said they would. And amazingly enough, they did. Fast forward to today, we've got a fleet of 41 UAS, and we have about 35 pilots right now. And as you can see in here, I just kind of threw a little org chart in. We've, uh, we are utilizing this technology in pretty much every one of our divisions within the department now. We found such a huge return on investment. And then also just uh, what comes with UAS, there's a lot of excitement that goes along with it too. People are excited to, to train and learn and be able to utilize these tools as part of their existing jobs. So as you can see in that org, a lot of them are utilizing it and we're seeing amazing things done with them. It's uh, it's not a tool that will do everything, especially under the like regulatory environment that we have now, but it can do quite a bit. And that's what I wanna kind of discuss here through this presentation for you. All right, so here's one of the areas I won't get into a lot of detail on this particular one, but where I've seen some great gains is just being able to utilize these instead of having to use those snooper trucks. Uh, since we have quite a few bridges, we can get these out without having to set up traffic control, get in and see all the, the little nuts and bolts and welds and everything that's important. Uh, this picture here on the left with that snooper truck, they're actually letting the people out. They've got to climb down the ladder, crawl into a small hole into this beam, and then they inspect it from the inside. So not the funnest job, especially uh, when they're got spiders and other fun things in there they have to contend with as they're crawling through these holes. And not an easy feat, but with UAS, we can actually fly around in here, look at what we need to be seen. And then if we need to get that arm's length inspection, we still utilize those tools, but it just helps us get better documentation. Where we've really seen some amazing feats too is just utilizing UAS with the structure for motion to map some of the areas, especially for delaminations once they have identified them. They were trying to paint a 10 foot grid on the deck and it would take a lot of time. So with the structure for motion, just flying a, an aerial photograph of that you can measure off of, we can get that traffic open up a lot faster. Not only that, using thermal technology in there, you can see we've actually been able to discover delaminations on the ridge deck as you see in this lower picture that they missed using a sounding method. So it's uh, they were quite impressed. They were a little uh, kind of like, oh, you're not gonna find anything. We're, we're awesome at sounding. You're not gonna find anything else here. And then put up the thermal and it says, wait a minute, what's this? And they're like, oh, it's probably nothing. And then they went and checked it again with the hammer and started tapping on They're like, oh, we actually missed one. So it's kind of cool what you can actually see with some of these tools. And you know, we're just in the infancy of this. Imagine where it's gonna be going. And I'll talk about some of that later on as we go. On to another project, uh, really about saving money. So just doing overhead sign inspections. Again, with a Z30 camera being able to zoom, let me just play this video here. Oops, let me back up. Let me see if it'll play. And uh, you can see from the side of the road, we can do this without setting up traffic control. We can zoom in here and see uh, all the rivets and make sure that they're they're in or not. In this case, you can see there's a bunch of missing rivets there. If I pause this video, you can see here there's a lot of missing rivets. In fact, we found out on one of our signs it didn't have any in it. The contractor who was doing it uh, put it up and didn't secure it. And we had no idea until we went and inspected it. And it's amazing that it hadn't fallen off. So with this particular job is on our SR-201 and I-80 corridors, 
we saved over $100,000 on that project by using this. And the way we saved that was not having to set up traffic control. Instead of doing only two signs at night, what they traditionally do, we were able to do 16 signs. And that was when we were training them. Again, uh, you guys get snow like we do, probably more snow than, than Utah. But uh, when it comes to, to springtime, we'd like to open up some of our highways if we can and, and plow those. But this particular year, we didn't have a lot of budget for that. So we zoomed in to see actually how much snow was there and compared it against the signs and determined we did have enough budget to actually open up that highway. So again, just some easy, useful things that you can do quite simply with uh, not a lot of effort, but a lot of value with that. So moving on with uh, the sign inspections and other things, what we found is there's a lot of data, which is intensive and somewhat boring for people to actually watch. So our structure inspector on those signs was having to watch the video, depending on who is flying and how good they zoomed in and out. He may have been getting motion sick and, and other items. So we're saying, how could we do this better? So we're looking at AI and machine learning. And with that, we, it's, we're letting the computer identify it. So our structure engineers, they can train the data set and then let's let the computer do it. And here you can see where it's found those miss, missing rivets. We can also see where there's good rivets, where there's bad welds, where there's other things. And the more we train it, the better it gets. So that's where we're, we're, we're utilizing this. Also on our airports, you can see right here's one of the runways we're doing our pavement conditions, checking that and letting the AI do the, the crack measurements and seeing how long they are, what the width is. It's uh, for the structure promotion, it's not too great on actually seeing if you got deviations in the payment or rutting or other items quite yet we're using lidar for that but uh, i think as future goes on and technology gets better this is only going to get better as well on to the next picture we're also using it to count vehicles up in our snow resorts we have some parking issues so we're getting flooded with people and with that flood we needed to figure out where we're going to have people park where they're parking and how many cars were actually there so we knew how much room we needed to make for additional parking so again we flew that with minimal overlap on these because we weren't doing the structure for motion per se but uh, we wanted to do machine learning so it wouldn't count them multiple times so we did multiple overlap on this and we're able to uh, count those cars with it so another piece of, of where we're, we're starting to utilize that all right looks like my controls may have went away on here yeah i had my screen pop up on the bottom so let me uh oh no worries get, trying to get rid of this let me see one second yeah, no problem. Oh, nice. Let me go ahead and just close out of that. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, let me jump back to here real quick. All right, should be coming right back. Okay, perfect. I have the taskbar. I'm not too sure why it's showing that bar on there, Paul, but go ahead and. Uh, okay. Let's see Audio. if I can just. Okay. <laughs> there it goes. I'll just use my arrow keys. That works better anyway. So, again, some more snow stuff. I, I can't share a lot of these things sometimes with other states because they just don't understand about avalanches and things as you guys do. You have a lot of them as well. So, this is. Uh, oops. Let me go back. I got a little crazy on my clicking here. Let's see if I can get that video to pop up. Let's see, for some reason it's not, there it goes, got it, okay. So this is on our gas egg. So we also use howitzers and we shoot these nice shells across our, our canyons there to help mitigate the avalanches, but we've also been using gas X technology. So it looks explode a big uh, cloud of gas here and uh, to help to, to hopefully set those avalanches when we want them to go. So what we're doing here is we were able to get this bird eye view to watch when we were testing these. And then after we tested them, we could fly up close and visually inspect them, which you're seeing right here, which we hadn't ever been able to do. As you can imagine, nobody wanted to volunteer to go <laughs> anywhere close to these after they detonated. So, but with the UAS, it's completely possible and safe. No one's going to get hurt. The worst thing that's going to happen is we may have a drone go down, but at least nobody's life is going to be at stake. So this is where we're seeing great gains in this. Also, our goal is to start following the avalanches as we set them and see how they go down the mountain, understand them better so we can better mitigate them as well. So just some ideas there. So 
I want to get into some of those best practices, lessons learned, and, and other things that's uh, really impacted us. So when you're doing that structure for motion and photogrammetry, what I've learned is uh, from a lot of pain, unfortunately, in the, the beginning of our program, we were trying to do everything we could with uh, like a Phantom 4 or a small rotorcraft. And with that, we had this square mile area and we're trying to, to fly these areas and it was taking multiple days to do this. In fact, it took us a whole week to fly this particular area. And what came into play was lighting conditions. It would fly it just fine, but when we actually went in and process it, if you had one data set from one day and then you tried to put in the second day's data in there as well, when you got done flying it, say, at the evening and then you went flying again in the morning, the shadows are far different. When you put that in a structure for motion, it sees it as two different areas. Even though it's the same area with the shadows and changes, it's just too dissimilar for the software to pick that up properly. And what would happen is we would get some offsets between the surfaces. So really pay attention to those things. If you're you're flying at the time of day, maybe what you could do is start in the morning, end in the evening, and then the next day start further down. So when you get to the evening, you come back to where you finished on the first day. So the shadows are more similar. Or process those areas separately is another item or if you can't do any of that what we found is lidar works great when you have a really struggling light conditions for that and i'll talk about lidar a little more but uh weather is another big piece of that with winds pay attention to a lot of the marketing hype that's out there because some of the aircraft they'll say they can handle some winds and then you actually get it into those and test it out and find out that it can't uh I had an unfortunate experience with one of our aircraft that does all of its compass calibrations in the air so it takes off, you lose complete control of it while it's doing a calibration. And then once it's done, then you have control. Unfortunately, we had a 60 knot gust of wind come up and it decided to blow the aircraft right at me. And behind me was our Interstate 70 where the speed limit's 80 miles an hour. So I put my hand up to try and stop it. It had carbon fiber guards around all the props. But with the, the vortices in the wind, it actually tipped it, hit my light bar, and then went into my finger and uh, cut me up pretty good. So I don't suggest trying to catch these. Even in that event, uh, many times we did have it bump up against things and it was fine. But when you get some wind and turbulence, it may twist. Uh, I won't gross anybody out with the pictures, but just know 22 stitches, about four months of trying to get my finger to work again. So pay attention to those and, and what your capabilities of your aircraft are. Understand those. Understand how the temperatures play on batteries as well. That's a, a big thing. If it's a very cold environment, uh, you guys have a lot colder than we ever could hope for. But uh, even in our cold environments where we're just getting, you know, maybe negative 10, we, we have to heat them up. Sometimes it's on the, the dash of the vehicle with the heater going, and that seems to help. Uh, we also have a lot of problems with overheating, which uh, I don't know if you guys have that there, but I get it quite a bit down in our southern portion of the state where it gets 115 degrees and it's typically not the the drones itself that has a problem it's the ipads or the tablets that are overheating so we will typically use uh, either the air conditioning vent from our vehicles to blow on the tablets or even just like your your cold ice packs or your lunch packs can help with that as well so just some of those things on on how to succeed think about those things when you're doing your pre-flight planning and it will really help also understand some of your overlap settings and characteristics on there as well and that will help you if you got a lot of vegetated area you may want to go up to maybe 90 percent on those overlap settings on your front and side lap where you may be able to get by with less if you have those so understand your camera settings too in difficult situations especially snow understand how aperture works how it affects your depth of field how the shutter speed works so you don't get motion blur and you get uh, sharp photos so the other piece there is charging batteries. Make sure you have a good way to, to keep those batteries charged unless you have an unlimited supply, which I don't think any of us do, but it, it can be difficult out there. If you try and use some of those inverters that plug into your, your cigarette lighter, your 12 volt adapter, they may start blowing fuses. I had issues with that. So sometimes a generator may be better or an inverter that plugs directly into the battery that's got a little thicker gauge wire. Just some of those things to think about really on, on succeeding. With that, uh, another thing I can't emphasize enough is use easy to use tools that makes it simple for your people to use and learn. And this is what we, we've done in our construction area is uh, we had a lot of problems getting some, some uh, motivation for people to use it because we got into the tools and some of them were too hard for them to use. So we found a more simplistic solution for them to be able to get quantities easy, do heat maps, uh, be able to cut cross sections and, and utilize this as another tool for for their toolbox and, and that's been seeming to work quite well.
Oh, it looks like your audio cut out here. Let me see here. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I got a message that I've been muted by the organizer, but I think it was me hitting space bar. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I was like, I was, I saw that. It's like you've muted Paul, and uh, so continue, Paul. Okay. Thanks for muting yourself. <laughs> yeah, right. Sorry about that, but space bar didn't unmute it, and it wouldn't let me click for a second there. So I apologize <laughs> for that delay. So uh, this is again that same software, but where we found some good usefulness in this is before your projects, if you'll fly these with your UAS and compare these against your existing X topo that you get from consultants or in-house, it allows you to really identify those issues before it ever goes to design, before it goes to construction or seeing great usefulness. This is an example of where we had a consultant use mobile LIDAR. They also had some terrestrial LIDAR and they used UAS for a hybrid model, but we went and checked it against that. And you can see the variation between some of those surfaces and we found out that the mobile LIDAR that they were using was having issues. And when they'd submitted it, they thought everything was fine. So it wasn't until these checks that we caught that. And if you look down at the bottom of this graph, you can see uh, our UAS flight data is kind of yellow. The existing uh, surface topos there, you can see old surface, you can see the mobile LIDAR in here as well. So you can see how those all compared, but we found errors in the mobile LIDAR. So by, by using this and identifying quicker, it really helps with uh, keeping those design changes or errors or maybe a, a change order that will happen in construction down to a minimum. So with that, I get a lot of questions about how do we get good quality data? How do we get survey grade data out of utilizing UAS? And there's a variety of ways if you've got a system that's got PPK, post-processing kinematics or real-time kinematics or also ground control. So ground control I utilize even when I'm using an RTK or PPK system. But if you don't have it and you're just starting with a, a more simple aircraft, ground control can work. Uh, with that, you can really use a variety of targets. Anything you can see out in the site, you can use for this ground control to help make that a better, more quality map. So we create some of our own or we paint on the pavement. There's arrow points. Some people are using bucket lids with washers. So the key is just make sure it's high contrast, that you can see it from the air. And if it's on like an asphalt, make sure it's a, a white or a reflective surface. If it's on concrete, sometimes white may not be your best choice. So just make sure you can see that from altitude. Take a little test flight and make sure you can see them before you do your mapping and that will really help you to identify those out there. Some other considerations to really talk about is what's the ground material like? Is it silty? If you're trying to paint it, is it just gonna blow away? You can't always paint them. In our national parks, we, we can't put paint all over the ground. They wouldn't be very happy with it. So sometimes you need to use aerial tape or maybe just simple, simple foam core or something else. Uh, pay attention to shadows though. As you can see up in this top picture, you can see an example of where the, the ground control point was painted. However, by the time they flew it, the sun from that guardrail was right over the top of it and it became unusable. So when you're setting those, just think about uh, what could impact that. Is there a tree canopy above it? Is there something else that may cause some weird issues with shadows because the dynamic range of those cameras aren't sufficient sometimes that if a shadow's over it, you'll be able to see it. So just uh, some things to really think about as you're setting that ground control. Also, another one is make sure you're painting numbers on there and they're large enough to read and they're not blurry. It's uh, when you're playing the game of trying to find all these targets, I equate it to playing Where's Waldo sometimes. And if you don't put numbers on them, it's really hard to tell at times from the orientation of that photo where it's actually at and which control point's which. So if you get in the habit of painting large numbers that corresponds to that control point, it can really help with that. But make sure your numbers are big. If you're on the ground and the surveyor's thinking the, the number's big enough to read from the ground, it may not be large enough to read from the air. So make sure it's sufficient that whatever ground sampling distance you're using for that flight, that the, the numbers can be read. It's another lessons learned. And th this is a funny one. I don't know what it is, but people cannot resist parking on our control points. I'll put it out there and this semi could have parked a half a mile either way on here. And they decided to park right on top of our control point. So have enough sufficiency of points that if they somebody does park on one that you're not going to be in trouble. So have some extras in there and maybe just paint them where they can't park on top of them. So it's another uh, lesson learned. 
what we found that works well is uh, keep your ground control points more, no more than about 1,000 to 1,500 feet apart from each other to get a good quality data set. Some people are going down to 500 feet. Um, that works good as well, but it creates a lot of extra points that you have to set. So, And when you're setting them, set them kind of like the, the five side of a die, which I'll show you in the next slide what that looks like. But make sure they're randomized. Don't have them in a straight line. Have them uh, throughout the the actual project and make sure they're not on the edges because if you don't have enough images with overlap it can cause some issues too with accuracies so here's what i was talking about the five side of a die now this is kind of on the edges so you want to bring them in a little bit or just fly a little bit outside there to make sure you get additional overlap and that will really help with those ground control points and don't just set them to be a ground control point also do some verification points too which i'll i'll talk about but uh, just a comparison if you did just rtk alone here you can see the accuracy you get about uh, 0 0.081 meters if you use a ppk system you're getting about 0 0.067 meters of accuracy if you're using that in coordination with ground control points it takes it clear down to 0 0.048 so you can see the changes by using gcps even with the ppk or rtk system if possible sometimes it's not possible to get on the mountains or cliffs so that's uh, something to think about what we really use and helps is we tend to use more PPK than RTK because it's not as susceptible to losing initialization during the flight. Because if it loses that link with RTK while you're flying and it geotags an image right there, that image is pretty much worthless for you. So ensure that uh, you've got a good link all the time or simply what we've turned to is just PPK. It's post-processing kinematics, so you don't have to have that real-time signal. It's collecting the data. You've got another base station or what I'm showing right here is our statewide network, which it's called the statewide network, but we've actually partnered with Nevada and Idaho and Colorado and Wyoming. And you can see this is down in Las Vegas. Uh, this is Salt Lake. Uh, we're actually gonna be going clear out to Reno. So it's a little more than a statewide, but what this does is it triangulates all those bases. We can create a virtual base station anywhere we're at. So we can just drop a pin and say, calculate from all those other stations, a point here, give us that Rhinex data and we can use it in the PPK processing. So. Uh, a statewide system is an amazing thing to have if uh, you have the ability to do that because it really saves a lot of time. We don't have to set up base stations. And I know since you guys are such a larger state, it may be a little more difficult to do that, but the, the value in this is great. And not only that, we can use it for what we're doing, but a lot of the other companies out there can use it as well. And that's how they're supplementing the cost is some of our utility companies are using it, other construction companies, and we're having a subscription based on that to help support our system. So it works quite well that way to get the data that you need. Another piece I really like to, to emphasize here, and it especially applies to, to you guys in Alaska, as it does in Utah, again, since we have a lot of changes in the ground elevation, is make sure that it has a terrain awareness. So it will stay that consistent altitude above the ground level at all times, because if you take off down here, say on the roadway, you fly up to 200 feet, you may fly right into the side of a mountain. Well, if you fly at the highest point and then you fly over here, ground sampling distance might be sufficient over the top of the mountain, but over here it may be two or three times less than what it would be otherwise. So find a software that you can use that will fly that consistent height above the altitude so your ground sampling distance will stay consistent and it will increase that quality of your data. Now, it's hard to find some software that will do that. Uh, the one I'm showing right here is MapPilot that will do it. Your EBs that you have, you probably already played around with that. You can do the, the terrain following Kitty Hawks now in beta that we've been testing, that they're adding that in. I've been trying to communicate this to a lot of different vendors that this is really what we need. It's not flat in a lot of the country and we need to have that consistent mapping. So look for something that will do that terrain awareness and that will help you to, to get more consistent uh, quality in your maps. The other piece here is on your camera angles. So it plays a huge part. I just showed two different things. So if you do straight nadir on here and do a 90 degree angle, you can see at these cliffs here, you're getting gaps. If you'd rotate it up to where the nadir angle was, it looks great. But when you start rotating in 3D, you can see where there's holes in the cliffs and other items where if you fly it at a 70 degree angle, as you see in the left picture, it will help eliminate a lot of those problems. Like Brian alluded to with the EB, how you're getting both. It also helps in that vegetation. So that's where sometimes your, your rotor craft can come into play because you can adjust that camera angle a little more easily on that. But just something to, to really think about for that, that quality data. As we get into LiDAR and UAS point clouds here, here's another area to really think about. When you're doing structure for motion, it tries to blend things together. This is the same runway. And if you look at this photo on the, the right, this is 
your your pixel point cloud or your photogrammetric point cloud and you can see that the runway here looks quite wavy there's a, a lot of uh, rutting it looks like in it but that necessarily wasn't the case it's actually quite flat if you look over on the left hand picture same runway see how flat that is what was causing that waviness was all these weeds so the structure for motion it was just taking all these little spots of the weeds and trying to smooth them out with the algorithms and that's what you see as the result so it wasn't an accurate representation of that so there's some of your strengths and weaknesses between uas lidar or uas point clouds with photogrammetry versus your lidar on there and here's some examples where we've really found lidar shines so when you have a lot of vegetation and you need to get some penetration through that. So as you can see here, there's a lot of trees, a lot of bushes. This is uh, a little river valley that they're having a hard time actually surveying. They're having to get on their hands and knees and crawl through the oak brush. And uh, sometimes they wouldn't even get canopy with GPS. And that's where the LiDAR really shine. We could fly that, it would get down right through those. As you can see on this bottom photo on the left, how it was able to get right down through the ground, through that vegetation, through the returns. From having that aerial perspective, and having multiple returns on the LiDAR, you can see what we were able to get, that true ground surface. And we had a project in Bryce Canyon where it would have taken them probably about a month and a half to survey it with traditional tools. We were able to fly it one day and then doing the process, and it took us probably two more days on top of that. So you can see the, the cost savings that you can see with that. Even though it's a, a lot of expense to, to get into the LiDAR business, it's a great tool if you need it. You don't always need it. Structure for motion can do a lot, but when you get in a lot of vegetated area, that's sometimes where it's it's worthwhile to have that. Where we've really found the best method is using a hybrid method. So get the benefits of, of all your tools. So don't throw away your old surveying tools. Still use some of those. Still use maybe mobile LiDAR. Use your, your GPS, your total stations. Combine the strengths of those with your UAS. As you can see here, we use terrestrial LiDAR on the roadway. Then we use the UAS to fly all this other softscapes and then combine the two to get the best of both worlds. And that's where we're really seeing the, the biggest gains from getting the most accurate design grade data of doing that. So I'm gonna switch gears here a little bit from the smaller UAS and go up into the bigger ones and, and talk about that just a little bit. So everybody's growing. Uh, hope, I don't think you guys have some of the, the issues we have with traffic, but uh, we have a, a a bad problem with traffic it's uh we're not quite la luckily but it's it's get moving that way unfortunately a lot of more people are trying to move into our state and we just don't have the capacity for it so we're trying to look for a good solution for that and uh this is kind of where it comes into the advanced air mobility i know a lot of people see fifth element over here and they're scared of is this what the world's going to look like coming up some people equate it to the jetsons so We've really been trying to look at what is it really going to be like? How can we plan for this? How can we we uh, make this happen? So a lot of times people are saying, well, when is this going to happen? And I know you guys are doing a little bit on it as well. So sometimes people just don't believe the timetable, but it's actually happening now. The, the small package delivery is already happening. I think you guys are working on some larger package deliveries as well. So I'm preaching to the choir on this, but really in the next five to ten years it's going to be a little more mainstream and we need to be thinking about this so it's it's going to be interesting it's going to be exciting they they say it's going to be from what the the change from the horse and buggy to the automobile was we're going to see that same change again here probably in the next 10 20 years so really what we're trying to do to, to prepare for that is we we worked with our university of utah to create a simulation i'll go to the next slide and, and show you this on the video of uh, what we've done. So we're, we're putting highways in the sky, putting these corridors up there, putting vertiports on the ground, we're spawning aircraft, and you can see on the top left uh, how many drones will be spawning here in just a second, and their average speed. So we've got two different layers segregating these. We got a, a package delivery layer and we have an aerial taxi layer. And we're looking at what does that look like above our city? So this is in our downtown area of Salt Lake City. And this is, you're looking at the Temple Square area. So you can see right now there's 66 drones spawn and it's going up and down. So you can see what this would look like. We looked at intersection designs. How can we make them incorporate with each other? How can we make this work with manned aircraft? And this is kind of the, the picture of that, what it could look like. How many drones could we get in the sky at a time too? How do they coexist with each other? That was some of these questions we were really wanting to answer. We're still kind of in the infancy of this, but you can see those multiple layers. So you can see the, the package delivery layer, it's down lower. You've got the aerial taxi layer up above. You can see now we're at, uh, what, 200 and 
40 drones going up of what this looks like on through these corridors. And these are on autonomous flight plans. We've just got them doing autonomous. We're seeing where they conflict. And when it does conflict, it puts a, a thing here. What you're looking at in this is we also had people say, well, is it going to blot out the sun? Are we not going to be able to see? So we turned off all those corridors had. Right now it's 325 aircraft in that sky to, to show what it looks like. And it doesn't blot out the sun. There, There is a lot of aircraft, but they are a lot smaller. So that's kind of what it would look like and some of those questions that we had. So that's uh, kind of the other piece that we're, we're working on there. The other thing is looking at radar infrastructures to, to get coverage for that, working with Fordham and their TrueView. To, uh, in Utah, we're a little unique in that our urbanized area is all kind of in a line along what we call the Wasatch Front, and most of the rest of the state is rural. So it'd be easy for us to create these aerial corridors in our most populous areas. So that's what we're looking at uh, potentially doing to for beyond visual line of sight and other things to, to see how it coordinates. We're looking at the, the radar, we're lock, looking at using DSRC, which is on our signals that talks to our snow plows and talks to uh, buses and eventually to the automated connected vehicles. So we're also looking at um, some of the remote ID and other pieces or using the 5G network. So that's uh, really where we're, we're looking at going. Uh, we've got the infrastructure set with fiber to be able to, to handle the, the data bandwidth for this, we hope. So that's, that's kind of the goals and what we're really working towards and, and sharing with others. But when it comes down to all the UAS, the data collection, it's really what I, I like to call the new era of data collection. We're getting so much good dense data. It's, uh, it's amazing how this has changed the way we do it. We're able to keep people off the road and hopefully reduce those fatalities. But with that, it creates a lot of data. So have a plan and make sure you know how to store that. Get the most uses out of your data as well. It sounds like you already have a GIS image server. We're doing the same thing with all our flights, so multiple people can use that. We can even bring that into our CAD systems, and then we're hopefully getting the most use out of our data that we possibly can to, to get the value for it, since it is such a large data set with that. And uh, I appreciate you allowing me to, to speak. I feel honored. Uh, there's my contact information if you have any questions. Paul, thank you so much, and uh, yeah, absolutely, we love we love having you speak. And um, let's see, I'm switching back over to control. All righty. Um, any question? Did we have any questions during that presentation? I'm double checking here real quick. Paul, I did have one question for you. Um, where have you seen within your department the the most benefit with the, the different groups, either that be survey or, or bridge inspection or m and um, Where are you seeing the largest um, uh, integration with your department? To be honest, it's been in every area that we've implemented it. So it's from our maintenance division using it simply to, to fly fence, what would have taken them a day to hike up and down that. Uh, they can do it in an hour. So it's really everywhere that we're using. If you're looking at, at actual money savings, uh, probably our overhead sign inspections was a large one for that. The bridge inspection, we're seeing great gains, but we still have the regulations to, to stay within on federal highways at this time. You can't use UAS as a sole tool for that. So I'd probably say our overhead sign inspections are surveying for sure on project savings that I've shown on some of those projects. We had one with a a utility that we saved what would have been two thirds of its budget to fix a change order on that that we would have missed otherwise. So in there, I, I'd say at this time, we've probably saved millions of dollars uh, on our LIDAR unit alone, just our cost projections when I purchased that, I figured we'd save three and a half million over the next five years of just what I projected, but I think we're already there. So wow. it's, it's amazing. Every area we put it in geotech, other areas, it's hard to quantify some of those right now on the, the savings, but even our, our natural disasters, we had the, the earthquake that uh, we'd used it for. We just had a bad windstorm that blew down a bunch of stuff, so we're using it there. And it's, it's hard to get exact return on investment of those, but the ones that we've tracked, uh, it's always shown a, a pretty good gain on, on that. But again, it doesn't replace manned aircraft on some real large ones. I wanna emphasize that too. If you've got a huge area to fly, sometimes it's still worthwhile to just get out a, a manned aircraft and do that. Absolutely, yeah. That seems to be the area that we're we're slowly starting to discover is where that where that break even line is for uh, manned versus unmanned. But hey, Paul, I wanted to thank you again, and uh, definitely if uh, I'll be sending out all of Paul's information here to everyone in the group. So if you do want to contact him, um, you'll have that here after the exchange.
Let's see, next up, I have Mark Holskitter with Anchorage Police Department. Let's see, Mark, it looks like I am double checking. You're self-muted now. All right, there All right. we go. Sh should be unmuted now. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Ryan, I appreciate that. And good morning, everybody. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Mark Kilsketter, and I'm a sergeant with the Anchorage Police Department. I've been with APD for um, about two months shy of 26 years at this point. Um, I wear kind of multiple hats at the department. I'm presently assigned to the FBI and the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And essentially, I do a bunch of liaison between the federal law enforcement agencies here in Alaska and, and the Anchorage Police Department. And one of the uh, other additional hats that I wear is I'm on the technical support unit for our SWAT team. And that was kind of the, the area of the genesis of our unmanned aerial systems program. So if you can go to the next slide for me, Ryan. So uh, basically what you're gonna hear today is, is nothing earth shattering, nothing new. I'm just gonna kind of tell you how the Anchorage Police Department has put together our program, uh, what we use it for, how we can use it, where we can use it, and kind of why we don't use it in some uh, scenarios. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, when I came up with an idea of, of bringing the uh, program to the Anchorage Police Department, I, I kind of wanted to start with why on earth do we want them? So uh, what I came up with was the Anchorage Police Department will operate a small unmanned aerial system for the purpose of enhancing the public safety while we're while respecting the privacy of our citizens. A successful SUAS program will assist law enforcement by providing increased situational awareness, enhanced officer safety, and act as a force multiplier to improve operating efficiency and effectiveness. That was kind of the, the core idea that I wanted to bring is that these, this wonderful technology has to be a benefit to the citizens of the Anchorage, and we have to maintain that privacy. Next slide. Okay, so this is it. This Our program is very simple at this point. Uh, essentially, we have two Mavic Pros, the first generation, and we have one Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual. Now, we're obviously looking to upgrade it all the time to new and better, but uh, for us, you know, budget is a, is a huge concern, as it is with a lot of small agencies around the United States, and we just don't have a very large budget. So this is what our program is. What our program is not, so on the next slide here, I had to I had to overcome the idea that a quote unquote drone program was something sinister, uh, something bad, and uh, that was one of the biggest hurdles uh, when I first started looking into this. Uh, my administration really didn't like the connotation that was attached with the concept of drones, so I wanted to make sure that they understood that it was not something like that. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do we use it for? Um, I have three primary uh, concepts here on this slide here. You know, we do it for search and rescue. That's a, kind of a, a no-brainer. Um, that's a, a very powerful use for equipment like this. Uh, we also use it for our tactical deployments. So we can help us, uh, assess situations involving hostages or barricaded subjects, support for other large tactical operations and uh, other temporary kind of perimeter security situations. And then investigatory scene documentation. So think about a crime scene, uh, major accident scene or other large outdoor scene. But really what I'm missing on here is a fourth, uh, a fourth topic and that's for general public safety. So in November, 2018, we had that 7.1 magnitude earthquake here, which you know we're still having a few um, aftershocks to this day, uh, but we were able to take that drone and go out and image uh, areas of our port, uh, a couple other areas, including uh, one of our bridge spans here that, you know, we were concerned there was some damage. Um, and Ryan, I, I don't know how well the uh, the video will play for this this particular slide, but this was a, uh, a kind of a success that we had back in March. We were able to locate a, a lost hiker and, um, you know, frankly, Ryan, it's playing really slow on my computer, so we can skip this slide and uh, we can always make that video available uh, some other some other way. So uh, what was important when I put together my program was I wanted to ensure that we had uh, very specific um, restrictions on how we would use it. You know, I, I understood all the concerns. 
Uh, I actually met with ACLU. I met with uh, a lot of people who were able to voice their concerns. So the uh, municipality of Anchorage decided to enact an ordinance. And fortunately, they, uh, they based a lot of it on my proposed um, policy. So most importantly, we're not going to use it in violation of an existing Alaska statute which governs the law enforcement use of unmanned aer uh, aircraft systems. We're not gonna use it for routine patrol activities. So, you know, we're not gonna have our patrol officers out there flying a drone over the highway with a stopwatch trying to catch speeders or anything like that. Um, we're not gonna use it for any kind of warrantless search on somebody's property. Um, when we're specifically seeking evidence as part of a criminal investigation, uh, we're not gonna use it in a manner that violates uh, a person's reasonable expectation of privacy unless we have a warrant or in accordance with the ju judicially recognized exception to the warrant. And a little bit of forethought actually paid off because very recently here, um, we were handed down a court decision. It's uh, McKelvey v. State of Alaska, if anybody's interested in looking at that, where they considered the, the use of uh, an aircraft supplemented by the use of a telephoto lens. So taking not just the, the fact that the aircraft flew over to somebody's house, but we actually had a law enforcement agency use a telephoto lens to be able to gather evidence they wouldn't necessarily be able to see with the naked eye. So you have to, when you're putting together a program, consider these types of restrictions that may come in the future. And that's hopefully what I did when I addressed that in, in our policy. Next slide, please. Okay, the other... Uh, Areas that we won't use it. Obviously, we're going to comply with everything that the FAA uh, expects out of us. And the one other big red flag thing is, you know, we're not going to equip our UAS with weapons or use it in any way, shape, or form as a weapon. Next slide. All right. So, how do we use it? Well, currently, uh, all the requests for uh, our UAS have to go through our uh, special operations commander. And I really wanted my officers to have some considerations for how we can use it. So what's important is we need to know where it's going to be um, and that it's going to be used something that is a way to en enhance safety either for uh, our citizens or our officers. I need to understand the area of operation where it's going to be uh, deployed. So, you know, we have here in Anchorage, we not only do we have a, a decent sized international airport, but we have the busiest seaplane in the world at Lake Hood and a very busy general aviation airport here at Merrill Field, which comprises a lot of air traffic in and around the Anchorage area. So I needed to make sure that um, when it's requested, we understand any potential air-to-air -air conflicts, uh, whether or not we're gonna be operating uh, anywhere around the airports around here. And we need to make sure that we're gonna do it in coordination with all the requirements in our certificate of authorization that we have from the FAA. Next slide. The other factor I want everybody to consider when they request a UAS is our weather and it's a potential effect on the aircraft. Uh, you know, these these are wonderful pieces of technology, but they, they still have their weaknesses and weather is a very big factor up here. And then the last highlighted thing down at the bottom was the potential usefulness of the information that we're gonna gather versus getting it through other means. As much as I like this technology, sometimes it is not the best tool for the job, and there's other ways to do it. So I always want there to be an assessment uh, kind of done in a in a risk matrix to what's the risk of uh, to our operation by using this tool versus using something else, and when uh, the outcome could potentially be the same. Next slide. So as far as our operations, uh, again, I wanna stress that uh, the, one of the biggest important considerations in my program here is safety. So we're gonna comply with the FAA regulations. So of course, we're gonna make available to the FAA upon the request, uh, the UAS and, and any documentation. Um, I require my pilots to conduct a pre-flight inspection of the aircraft and control station, follow a checklist, and make sure that everything is ready to go for a safe operation. Next slide. Um, we have this, we've had a track record so far of some really wonderful interagency coordination. Uh, we've worked well with our the Anchorage Fire Department. We've done some work for the Division of Forestry. Uh, we've helped out the Anchorage Water and Waste Utility. And then all the 
various departments within APD from our crime scene to our traffic unit uh, to our training unit where we are able to shoot some video of, uh, of tactics. And then uh, our SWAT team, obviously, they really like having the ability to have an aircraft overhead ready to go to help be that extra eye in case uh, somebody breaks out of the perimeter. Next slide. So this photograph is just a, a real quick example. I'm no, I'm not uh, showing anything that's that's uh, anybody doesn't already know. But we were actually out uh, with the UAS in Anchorage, uh, flying a, a different mission when there was a fire in the Chester Creek area in 2019. It was a, a very warm summer, very dry, very dangerous fire season, and a fire broke out in a, in a green belt. And what was interesting, at the uh, we offered to the aircraft to uh, the fire department to, to help take a look at the fire scene. And when we took off and, and flew overhead, they were actually surprised. If you look at the very top of the photograph, there's there's a house there. When they were suppressing that fire in the woods, they had no idea that they just how close they were to that residence. So they were they were really thankful that we were able to deploy for them. And they, it really kind of opened their eyes at the, the powerful uh, ability of this tool. Uh, next slide. All right, so this is a, another uh, same area, different fire, um, but we flew for the fire department on that day. And the next couple of slides is going to show just the, the wonderful capability of having an IR camera in the sky and the, and the suppression of the fire. So this is kind of the, the first stage of the suppression. We flew the area. On the left is the infrared. It shows you where all the hot spots on that fire were. And on the right is what you can see. You know, optically, if we go to the next slide, you can see same general area up, taken up a little bit higher. You can see the effects of the suppression now. Um, there's a lot fewer areas of hot spots. And again, on the right hand side, it's just that optical image. And at that point, they'd already figured that they'd suppress the fire. But when they were able to look back in infrared and see those hot spots, uh, it was very eye opening and surprising where they had potential for flare-up. Let's go to the next slide. You can see now that this is obviously this is essentially 180 degrees, but those hot spots now after they went back and addressed them are are almost gone. So you know in, in a very high uh, fire danger year, it was an invaluable asset to be able to to respond with the, with our aircraft and help out the fire department. Next slide. All right, so where can we use it? Well, this is a, a sectional chart, um, and the red outline there is the, the geographical boundaries of the municipality of Anchorage. So it's a very large area that we can fly. There's very few areas that we can't fly. Obviously, in certain portions of Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson, they're not going to allow us to fly over there because those are considered classified, but um, we can still fly with them with some coordination. Next slide, please. So uh, we have a certificate of authorization. We're actually on our second iteration of the certificate of the COA. Uh, our first iteration, we were able to fly in controlled airspace in the municipality of Anchorage. Uh, all we had to do was pick up the phone and coordinate with the appropriate air traffic control tower or agent in that area, and we could fly. So we could fly in and around Anchorage International, Lake Hood, Merrill Field, Elmendorf, uh, Bryant Army Airfield with the uh, with the ATC coordination. Now in our second uh, iteration of the COA, we still have that ability. Uh, it's just looks a little bit different. We now have a facility map that looks a lot like the Lance facility map that that gives us a grid with a maximum altitude. Uh, if we need to, for any reason, to go above that altitude, we can then pick up the phone, contact the FAA's uh, SOSC and request a special government interest waiver, which will waive the altitude restriction for us, uh, which is still, it, it takes a few moments, but uh, so far we've had great success with that. Next slide, please. So obviously coordinating with ATC can slow our, our response time a little bit because they have a lot of things that happen on their end as well. They may need to rewrite uh, some of their, reroute some of their flights while we're operating and 
they may have to tell us to land if they've got some other emergency going on. So we do our best to maintain that contact. We have a VHF radio with us. We monitor the monitor the common traffic frequency for the area. And uh, so far to the state, we've had zero issues. Next slide. Okay, um, so our COA looks a lot like the Part 107 rule. Uh, we're required to fly within visual line of sight. We're required to yield the right-of-way to other aircraft. And we have to have a minimum of three miles of visibility from the control station. Next slide. We have the same uh, requirements that uh, Part 107 operators have. We can't exceed 100 miles per hour or 87 knots. And we're, we're directed not to operate our SUS over human beings unless they're directly participating in the operation of the small air, unmanned aircraft or, on the next slide, they have essentially adequate uh, protections for them. However, if we're searching for a suspect, um, we deem them to be part of our operation at that point. Uh, but we still uh, attempt to never fly over a person unless there's some uh, safety reason that would have to carry us over them for just a small amount of time. And then we do our best to clear that area. Next slide, please. Okay, limitations. Uh, very much a factor here. Uh, so UAS are, are awesome, but uh, we have to rely on being able to see them and they have to be able to see what we're looking at. So darkness is a big factor. So in the summertime here in Alaska, not not as much of a concern. We have daylight, you know, almost 24 hours a day for a part of the summer. But come wintertime, it's it's the reverse where we have, you know, five and a half hours of daylight. So um, darkness is a, is a big concern for us. Uh, even with uh, a spotlight that we have on our Enterprise Edition and the navigation light, it still makes it very difficult to fly. And it's something we need to consider before we deploy. Uh, rain is a concern because uh, Anchorage in the fall, we, we get rainy weather. It's a lot like Seattle in certain regards. Um, and we have flown in rainy conditions, but it's definitely not ideal. And then snow, uh, it affects it affects the aircraft in many ways and actually creates uh, another dangerous condition. So we have to evaluate that before we fly. And then just like Paul said before, uh, wind, you know, manufacturers do place a, a maximum wind on their aircraft. Um, and it's always tough to measure exactly how fast it's blowing. So we need to make sure that we we adhere to what the manufacturer's recommendations are and, and do not fly when it's greater than, than what they suggest. And then finally, the uh, temperature range. That was a, a big concern for our, our Mavic 1 because the operator's manual for the Ma Mavic Pro, the first edition, is that uh, you should not operate it in any temperatures below zero Celsius or 32. So for us here in Anchorage in wintertime, we spend most of our time down below that temperature range. So it, it was going to severely limit our potential operations. Next slide, please. So our plan when I started this whole program was uh, we wanted the, the crawl, walk, run philosophy. So we started off by crawling, basically learning the technology learning the regulations, <clears throat> excuse me, carefully choosing our missions, um, being very picky with what we flew. We, were, we essentially wanted to pick missions that would give us the highest probability of success and the biggest return on investment. Now that we've been flying since essentially 2018, I think we're in the walking phase of it. We have six pilots, we have three aircraft. We're constantly looking for more missions and more things to fly. To fly. And then in the future, hopefully, when the technology and regulations sync up, things get smoothed out a little bit, the Anchorage Police Department will be, will be ready to run. So what does that look like? I don't know for sure. You know, could it be a drone in every car? Or could it be, you know, like the, the agencies down near Silicon Valley that have a larger budgets and are part of the IPP where they can dispatch drones from a rooftop and get it in place before the officers get there? You know, hopefully that that works out, and I'm I'm very much looking forward to the future. This this technology has been game changing. It's uh it's wonderful, and uh, I I can foresee it being a, a very important part of policing in the future. Next slide.
All right. Well, that's essentially it for me. Um, Ryan, I want to thank you first and foremost for all the work you've done getting this uh, this peer exchange put together. It would have been great to do it in person. Um, it just I'm just happy to be part of this. Uh, just a real quick comment here on on the video. We flew. Uh, there was a large fire in the municipality of Anchorage, and we flew several days in a row in the morning hours uh, after the sun kind of came back up, and um, we were able to to provide video and real time image to the the division of forestry as they work to suppress that fire. So uh, I'll leave it open for if there's any questions, but I know there's going to be a Q and A session here a little bit later. So Ryan, thank yeah, you Mark. very much. I do have one question from the group. Um, yep. This is from uh, Galen Jones. Looks like, uh, are you have or are you or have you considered using UAS for searching homeless camps on public land for the purpose of stolen property identification and recovery? This may be a way to keep your officers safe by limiting public interactions and may also reduce potential allegations of harassment by civil rights groups. So that there's a there's a complex set of things going on there. So we have used the UAS to help us document um, areas where we do have some homeless encampments um, in that we did not specifically look for stolen property and things like that. Um, if we believe there to be stolen property, um, obviously being in a, in a public um, section of the woods, we could definitely fly over and look for stolen property. Um, it's very difficult to identify what property belongs to who from the air. That's something, you know, again, that we'd be better served by going in on foot. But by being able to fly and document the locations of the encampments, we know where they're at. We know where we can go contact people and, and hopefully re recover the stolen property. Excellent. Thank you. And I do have one question for you. Um, as, as one of the only public um, operators within the state uh, operating under a COA at the moment, what benefits have you found flying under um, a COA instead of using Part 107? Well, so for us, um, part of my program is actually requires our pilots to, to get their 107. So everybody with APD is 107 certified. So we actually have the best of both worlds. Um, for us, flying under the COA unlocks that uh, ability to pick up the phone, contact the FAA, and get that special government interest waiver for any, any type of emergency. So something that you may not be able to anticipate where if you had to fly under part 107, it might take you longer to, to obtain certain waivers. So for us, it was all about uh, time saving. And then, you know, ACOA is very specific for us to be a public safety related mission. But if we want to do a demonstration of our technology, maybe demo it to a high school or to a, to a news media, um, we then fly that mission under part 107. Excellent. Well, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate your time. And um, yeah, we look forward to having you on the panelist here uh, coming up next. All right. Thanks, Ryan. With that, uh, our next panelist, uh, Jake Sloan with uh, JS Media. Let me go ahead and unmute everyone again. So, um, Jake, you should have. Nope, not yet. All right. Let's see if that works now. You should be able to unmute yourself. Nope, still saying self-muted. All right, let me see what I'm doing wrong here. There you go. There we go. I think I was pressing the button too fast. I kept on <laughs> muting. <laughs> Got it. Yay, Jake, like technology take works. Of it as well, or, or have me pace through the slides? Um, If you wanna, well, yeah, if you don't mind, let me try to pace through, that'd be great. Yeah, Uh, you have keyboard and mouse control. Do I? Yeah, hey, just tap on the screen. Oh, going maybe, backwards. Maybe you better control it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. We're trying. Uh, all right. Well, let me go ahead and jump back here to your opening slide. And uh, Jake, it's all you. All right. Well, thanks, Rob, uh, or Ryan, for being here. I don't know why I just called you Rob. Too many people I've met in the last few days. Um, but thank you for uh, asking me to be a part of this and good morning, everyone. 
it's uh, exciting where this technology is bringing us as a whole, um, even with some of the challenges and complications that it presents. But to start off with, my name is Jake Sloan. I'm a Part 107 drone operator here. I'm a freelance videographer and photographer, and of course, drones play a large role in that um, for you know commercial clients here and in other places in the U.S. where I've been hired to work. Uh, and then one of the things that I do where drones really specifically come into play is I test and review cameras and drones and other related equipment that companies send me. I'll take out into the wilderness, as you'll see here shortly, and uh, test them out and see how well they handle Alaska or how well Alaska treats those things. And then post those reviews on YouTube and teach people how to use them, how to set them up, things like that. So in that, uh, even though I... I hate to use the term influencer because it generally brings a <laughs> negative connotation in my mind. I, I guess I am somewhat of an influencer. And because I post those, and specifically because all of my, all the, the environment that I operate in is Alaska and out in the wilderness, it gains quite a bit of interest from public people who want to know more about drones and especially people who are coming here for vacation, um, coming here to see Alaska for the first time. I'll get a lot of questions about you know, where they can operate legally, how they can fly up, fly legally, what they can do with their drones, what they can't do. And so I get to play the role of educator quite a bit in helping people understand the rules uh, for hobbyists uh, flyers and the rules for part 107 flyers. And then the rules that are really specific to Alaska because we have such a vast um, area to, to operate in, but we also have lots of national parks and uh, wilderness preserves and other places where it's not legal for those people to operate. And then of course we have tons of small aircraft that often fly through at very low altitudes, completely unannounced, and sometimes with very little warning. So I play uh, the role of educator to a lot of people who come up here for vacations to let them know how they can safely operate their drone, where they can safely operate their drone, and things they need to be aware of when operating in Alaska. Um, so that comes down to basically there, if you wanna to go to the next uh, slide there, there, there are three, really just three types of drones I use. Um, go ahead to the next one, Ryan. The first is DJI, which probably everybody is familiar with. I primarily use the Mavic 2 Pro because it's small and portable and because 90% of what I do, I've, I'm carrying everything on my back in a backpack. So the smaller, the more portable, the better. And um, with this, I've, I've really pushed this drone to its limits and probably even beyond its limits, definitely beyond what the manufacturer recommends, um, either by accident or uh, because we do deal with really cold temperatures. So I've flown the Mavic 2 pretty regularly at temperatures as 30, 40 below zero, at which point my phone or iPad lasts a couple of minutes and then my fingers give out, you know, five or six minutes after that because it's cold. Uh, and uh, the, ba the, the fantastic thing about the DJI drones is they've been in the technology long enough that the reliability, the um, the consistency of control, the image quality, the flight time, and the size with the capability that you get out of them is just, it's excellent, fantastic. Do you wanna go to the next slide, Ryan? So I've used, uh, used these drones to capture lots of footage. If you want to see the smooth versions of these, you can check out my Instagram or uh, YouTube. If you look up Jake Sloan on pretty much any social media, I should be the first thing that pops up. But it's it's such a fantastic tool to be able to capture um, angles. Um, go ahead, go to the next one too, Ryan, and and showcase some of the places that we have here. And then the next drone that I use, which is a newer drone to the market, it's made by a company called Skydio, and um, they're in California. It basically what Skydio has done is taken uh, an incredibly powerful computer and really advanced. Um, machine algorithm, learning algorithms, and put it onto a drone to showcase what it is capable of when it's on a flying platform. So this drone uh, sees the entire world around it in 48 megapixels. It has six 4K cameras that are 100% dedicated to obstacle avoidance. And, um, and then it has one 4K camera that's dedicated for filming. And so it will see everything around it at 360 degrees, stereo vision to be able to detect and avoid obstacles as small as a half an inch. And, um, and then it will intelligently plot flight plans through those obstacles. So you go, go ahead and go to the next one, Ryan. So I use this drone a lot because I work by myself so much and this drone has so much intelligence built in and is uh, 
is a, a really highly capable machine of avoiding obstacles, I use it like a second camera person um, because I have a small controller or just my phone in my hand where I can execute actions that are pre-programmed. The drone will you know, execute those actions while I'm also able to make sure it doesn't hit any obstacles or run into anything, which is really fantastic for me because I don't have to stand there with a big bulky controller to try and capture shots of me out in various locations like this. Now I realize the more I say this, the more I sound like a really uh, self-important influencer, which is probably why I hate the term influencer. But, but the thing that I love about these, these, those two particular drones is the ability for me to show the scale of the landscapes that I regularly go out and explore in Alaska is is important because when you see those places, you have no idea of the scale because it's like stepping onto another planet. There's no um, cars, there's no people, there's nothing familiar to us to show the to show or to give an example of how large or how small an area is. Um, and and by the way, before I jump too much further, I should note that I've I've been in mountaineering and and I've done search and rescue and stuff for uh, 22 years. Um, so when you see a lot of these things, it, they do look dangerous. Um, I do take some risks, but I'm also actually very cautious about the places I go and and the ways I go about going into these places. So the other type of drone that I use is the ones that I build myself. They're FPV drones, which is first person view drones. So you use goggles to fly them. They are incredibly fast, incredibly agile. They have a, a relatively short range, um, although there are people that fly them well beyond visual line of sight. Um, so the potential to go further is there. And uh, depending on how I set them up and program, they can or they may not have GPS um, capabilities and other capabilities. But what is uh, beyond just actually being a, a lot of fun to fly, uh, and I have little ones that I zip around the house with with my son, and we race all winter long when it's really cold inside the house, much to my wife's um, disappointment and uh, frustration, I'm sure. But in the context of filming and, and some of the places I go, go ahead to the next slide, Ryan. These drones, they're 100% built by me or by the people who operate them. Uh, but they're incredibly, um, they're capable of getting into areas and, and gathering footage that just isn't possible any other way. Uh, the footage that comes out of them would be very much like you would use a helicopter in traditional filmmaking for or an airplane. But because of the size, you're able to get into areas that would be physically impossible for a larger aircraft to get into or that would be much too dangerous to put people and equipment into. Um, go ahead to the next one, Ryan. It, because of the, the danger, the danger there, uh, but the the kind of footage and the kind of perspectives that you're able to capture with these drones is something that um, I've really just it's it, it's mind blowing on some of the things that you're able to do with these types of drones here. Um, this is second bit. Go ahead to the next one, Ryan. Uh, so those those are really powerful uh, vehicles because I've, one, most of them are small. I do have a larger one that'll carry larger cameras, but they're able to get into and, and get out of areas that you just physically couldn't with any other sort of aircraft and also provide the the types of footage and the, the feeling that you would normally get with a much larger aircraft with much larger camera systems, but also you'd be putting people at risk. So that comes to how I use drones in Alaska. Um, to me, uh, when I started my journey doing this, uh, posting videos on YouTube and being a, a quote unquote influencer, <laughs> the one thing that I that I have access to and the one thing that really sets me apart is the backdrop that is Alaska, the places that I'm able to go and explore, either because one, I'm willing to hike a really long distance um, to get there or because we have access to it via small aircraft or uh, snow machine or other ways like that. And so I use drones primarily to, to capture the beauty and to show the scale of the landscapes that we all live in in a daily basis to help um, to help tell stories and use them as a second a second camera person you can go ahead and go to the next slide Ryan um, they're they're incredibly powerful the perspective that they can provide for people to be able to see uh, areas that they just otherwise would never have the ability to see go to the next one 
and uh, and just showcase a lot of the natural beauty that's up here, which I hope, at least for Alaska, um, raises the the awareness of people in other parts of the country of of what a spectacular place Alaska is to come and visit, and and some of the spectacular things they can see when they're here. I I hope it um, you know increases our presence and the awareness of of, of just kind of a once in a lifetime destination that Alaska is. Um, these shots I actually captured two two weeks ago, I think, up in the Matanuska Valley, uh, right when the fall colors started hitting, which is short but incredibly beautiful up here. Um, and then go to the next one, Ryan. The other the other way I sh obviously using them to show the scale of things, uh, like this iceberg that was sitting in Portage Lake for a couple of weeks. Uh, I sat there for a good little while listening to it and watching it, making sure it wasn't making a lot of noise or motion to where it was getting ready to roll. And then I scooted by it as fast as I could. Uh, go to the next one. But the other thing is to show places that, that people just wouldn't ever have access to or wouldn't ever be able to experience. Go ahead. Um, and a lot of that's because I, I will spend a day hiking up three, four, 5,000 feet uh, scrambling over rock to try and get to places that are just very unique and very different. Um, go ahead. Yeah. And, or I have a, a couple of friends with small aircraft that will fly out to areas and, and land because a few of them are extremely short takeoff and short landing aircraft. We can find places to, to land safely and then get there and from there be able to launch drones and showcase places that, um, just very few people will ever have the opportunity to experience. And, um, and along the way, I get to capture some really amazing photos and, and videos of, of Alaska. Part of a large part of that is because I'm I always maintain a real um, caution towards situational awareness of, of areas that we're going and, and places we've been like this area here have been a, for a couple of years in a row. And the landscape changes dramatically from year to year because it's a glacier and because glaciers are always in motion. And for some reason, apparently I film a lot around glaciers. Uh, it's interesting to see the changes year to year. And so I'm kind of aware of where the glacier was from one year to the next. And um, and so I use drones a lot. Go ahead to the next one, Ryan. I use drones a lot to scout out safe path to higher risk areas or safe paths to areas that, um, at least as far as I know, there's no documented way to get there. You know, nobody's written out a trail map or anything like that. Um, go ahead, Ryan, to the next one. And so one of the places I wanted to get to was uh, this area up above Portage Glacier, which is a, a pretty, um, well, relatively easily accessed place, except for this area here. It's about 12 or maybe 1400 feet up to the left side of the glacier. Um, and the only ways to get there that I could see was through the glacier scree, which is the tailings of the rocks that the glaciers left by, which is generally very loose and very mobile. And especially if it hasn't been there for quite a while with um, some vegetation growing in it, it moves a lot when you put any weight on it. And then, or it's going up through the alder, uh, which is really a arduous and difficult journey, plus the possibility of running into wildlife um, at point blank range with both of us being surprised, which never ends well with wildlife. And so go ahead to the next one, Ryan. I was able to scout a path, a way to get up there on the rocks through the, um, through the glacier, not through the glacier, but through some of the areas that the glacier had receded from and, and get up to this area where it just basically, I wanted to go up and and take a, a nice photo and drink some coffee and just enjoy the view because it had been a lot of work the couple weeks before. And so it was time to rest. And, but also be able to showcase uh, and, and scout areas to like this, which is Burns Glacier. It's up behind Portage. Um, it's an area that I wanted to go to for quite a while. And there is a fairly well-documented path on one side of it, but there isn't to this side, the right side of the glacier. And we got up there, I found this ice cave. I was contemplating going into it. I flew through it a couple of times because I figured, you know, it's, uh, I can handle losing a drone. I'd rather not be inside an ice cave if it collapsed. And after seeing the interior of the ice cave and looking at it, decided it was safer not to. But also I used the drone in this particular area where on the left side of the glacier, there was actually quite a lot of sinkholes in the gravel. And so we were able to find a safe path that stayed on the bedrock, as opposed to down straight in the front middle of the glacier, there's clearly still ice underneath that gravel because the sinkholes that were appearing in some of the water that was going down into the sinkholes. 
So they've been become a really invaluable tool for me to be able to document my journeys and document my adventures, but also to find safe ways to get to places. Um, I think there's a couple more slides, Ryan, you could go to. Um, oh yeah, that's right. And and then to showcase Alaska to the world, go ahead to the next one. But the other thing, um, yeah, I started a thing where I was posting short video clips of myself and my friend drinking coffee in the most ridiculous places we could find. <laughs> and so this was one of them. And actually when I flew the drone out, I didn't realize it was pouring rain and snow out of, outside of the cave until the drone came back in. And then I realized, uh, but uh, another uh, somewhat of a side effect, I guess, it wasn't something that I intended to do, but because I go to many of the same places year after year, uh, I've been able to document a lot of the changing landscapes here in Alaska, which uh, if you don't know, glaciers are constantly in motion. They're constantly changing. Whether or not they're receding or advancing, they, they are a river of ice that's always in motion. And so everything is always changing around them and on them and in them. And so um, this is Byron Glacier, which generally has a pretty spectacular set of ice caves. Some of them are a little safe uh, or fairly safe in the wintertime. Most of them are not very safe in the summer. I wouldn't recommend people going them in the summer because they're they're just melting so much more. But this was last um, early November when I flew the drone down inside and, and we were kind of going down and in and out of this ice cave. And then this was about two weeks ago, flying the same, essentially the same line or as close as I could get to the same line uh, in the same area. So you can see the dramatic change and the dramatic difference of what where once there was a large ice cave with a large amount of ice is now shifted melted and and moved moved away into other areas and byron glacier is a glacier that's been retreating pretty rapidly over the last decade a portage has been one that's been retreating pretty rapidly as well and so that's it's kind of it's an unintended side effect that i guess i recently become aware of in the last six months as i've gone back to some of these places for now the third or fourth year in a row of realizing that I'm documenting the changes in Alaska's life landscapes um, just via the fact that I'm I'm shooting a lot of the same areas and shooting a lot of the same landscapes. And I know many of the drones I've got are capable of doing some mapping and some other things. I haven't really jumped into that um, just because it's not really my cup of tea or anything that I've really uh, pushed for on a business side or um, or been hired to do on a business side. But uh, drones have become a really powerful storytelling tool for me to be able to sh not just showcase the places that I get to explore and live in and work in, but document these incredible adventures that I have as I go out and test and review camera equipment and take photos and, and make videos for clients, whether they're here in Anchorage um, businesses and uh, or whether they're out and about if I'm going off to film a group of uh, people climbing a mountain uh, to document their journey up and down a mountainside or something like that. It's been, um, they've they've become a very integrated part of my storytelling and my documenting uh, journey of this life that I live in Alaska. So um, yeah, that's it for me. I guess I'll open it up for questions if anybody has questions. But again, thank you, Ryan, for putting this together and um, and, Thank you all for being here this morning and um, for allowing me to be a part of this. Jake, thank you so much for coming on and and yeah, showing the uses, uh, especially for us. FPV drones are, is is kind of the next you know big push with a lot of these systems and and where you're flying at in these GPS denied environments and of course these areas that you, you can't get to easily. Um, my question for you and as well as I, I think most of DOT. When you're planning your flight operations, what what's your gear list? When you, I mean, we we mentioned we have to fly out to a lot of these locations, and it's sometimes hike to a lot of these areas that we're we're surveying or mapping. But uh, what's what's your what's your minimum gear list that you're taking with you, and um, um, how has that proved helpful for you? Um, actually, that's a great question. So I, I always start out with by watching weather and studying weather that's incoming so I can start planning out my trips, uh, you know, maybe even as far as 10 days in advance, kind of watching for pockets and holes in weather where I might get some good weather. And then from there, I, depending on the type of shooting I'm doing, the environment I'm, sh I'm shooting in, I'll, I will try and just take one drone with me. So far that hasn't worked out. I've almost always ended up 
carrying two drones with me. And usually it's one of the GPS stabilized drones like the DJI Mavic or the Skydio and my FPV drone, just on the offhand chance that you know one of them might be better suited when I get to the location. Uh, and then I I have a, it's a, what is it, a 36 liter backpack, which, so I'll carry some other regular photography cameras, um, GoPro and stuff like that. Extra batteries, of course, a controller. Um, because in the last year and a half, I have uh, actively participated in the rescue of a few people or the uh, patching up of people who have fallen and hurt themselves. I always have a inReach with me and a first aid kit. Um, I mean, I have the inReach with me for me too, but it's actually ended up helping out a few other rescues that I happen to be in the same area when they you know, a climber fell off rocks or something like that. And uh, so I've, I've started carrying, uh, or yeah, I've been, I've be begun to carry around more first aid gear than I usually did um, in that sense. So that, and then I usually have just a little bit of survival gear with me. If I end up, you know, if something goes wrong, like if I'm going out in a small plane with somebody, we always have enough that if we've got to spend a night or maybe three or four nights, God forbid, we'll have, you know, food, water, sleeping bags, tent, shelter type stuff um, with me there. If I'm just hiking out to it, I'll, I, even if the weather's nice, the weather changes so fast up here, especially when you get the mountains, I've always got rain gear with me and, um, you know, some other stuff that in case I get caught by a surprise storm, I can weather it out and wait it out until I can get out um, later that day, hopefully. So that, uh, what else? I mean, that that comprises most of the stuff I take with me. Um, I I do carry a weapon, a uh, pistol with me for bear. Um, I've just seen too many instances. I used to do bear, bear viewing trips when I was much younger and maybe slightly less wise. Uh, I did a lot of bear viewing trips up in Telkina up the river. And um, I saw a lot of instances where bear spray didn't work at all. And so I much prefer to have a handgun with me. Um, so I'll have a handgun and then I'll have a uh, you know some other safety equipment if i'm going to be around glacier i'll usually have a set of crampons maybe an ice pick with me uh if i if i'm going to test walking on a section of the glacier or something like that i'll go with safety equipment like that um to date i've only lost two drones one in a glacier crevasse as i was filming and the second was one of my fpv drones that went down in the lake in front of Kinnick glacier and actually last week i recovered that drone using a piece of rebar a net and about 100 feet of nylon rope uh so very exciting for me i don't think any of it works but the fact that i was able to recover the drone i was really excited well excellent well thank you jake and, and just to add to that for everyone that's on the uh call today here within alaska uh alaska actually does have minimum equipment uh statutes uh, emergency rations and equipment so uh for those of you that are interested it's section 02.35.110 uh and that's showing you the minimum equipment required when you're taking uh, or basically survival equipment when you are heading out into the outdoors. So, and that's different equipment for summer versus uh, winter times. But I'll be sure to add that on our on our UAS website for you guys to look at as well. But other than that, Jake, thank you so much, uh, and I look forward to having you on the uh, question and answering here a bit later. Thanks. Up next, uh, we have a very uh, probably one of the smartest um, um, people I know. Uh, Aaron Mason. Uh, Aaron Mason, I've, I've worked with him in the past with uh, UAS technology, and he was the first person I ever met that could make anything, uh, uh, any data go in with any data. And so I'm very excited to have you guys see what Aaron's been up to and, and how he's using all of this technology uh, and tying it together. Um, and so with that, Aaron, would you like control or you want me to slide, go through your slides? Uh, control would be great if I could. Have all right. I'll have to learn to pace myself. So uh, we'll start with a brief introduction. And I tend to speak quickly, have a lot to cover, and I'm open to questions. Some of this is fairly streamlined to make sure that I can get to some of the key points. But I have to start with covering some of the basics. First off, uh, I have a, a broad range of experience in utilities and construction. I've done civil inspection and testing for concrete and dirt work and asphalt and and um, those type of things. I've also worked as a surveyor for a couple of years, not as a license, but on a survey crew doing uh, construction layout and property and those type of things. 
but my primary experience is in using AutoCAD and design software and GIS, and that includes working in the virtual design and construction space. So the goal being that leveraging three-dimensional design and building information modeling to provide better workflows, better analysis, and better use of our data to help streamline the engineering design and construction process. And I'll, I'll, that's really the goal I wanna cover here. I've been working at MLMP for almost 15 years, and that's where most of my experience, all, pretty much all my experience in reality capture and drone uses come from. I think the utility space, uh, having a lot of people in DOTs will probably understand a lot of what we do. We do a lot of undergrounding, so a lot of utility construction is related to road projects or roadways or civil construction methodologies, which is where we see kind of the biggest bang for the buck in UAS services for construction and design. We're currently in the process of being acquired by Chugach Electric, which is gonna add a, a lot larger service territory. They're far more rural than we are. We work in the downtown Anchorage area in the congested airspace, which includes what you've seen for Merrill Field and Lake Hood, the military base, and also the Anchorage International Airport. But this gives us the opportunity to actually leverage UAS for things that we don't have as much of a need for, of longer transmission lines, more rural areas, and I'll talk about some of that as well. So the first thing I wanna talk about is uh, reality capture for utilities. We consider the UAS part of our reality capture package, which includes terrestrial scan owners, mobile LIDAR, ground penetrating radar. And I think it's important to look at UAS and its capabilities to supplement with these other with these other types of technology. It's a very robust platform, but if you look at it in the context of what can it provide me, uh, getting into confined spaces, access issues that you can't get, the top down view of a UAV versus the ground up from mobile LIDAR or from traditional surveying. There's a lot of different values you get that complement other pieces of work for surveying construction practices. And that's the way we look at it as a part of a holistic approach to how we do engineering design and management. And so <clears throat> thinking as another tool in this tool set, it's important to evaluate a lot of the things you've heard that I'm not gonna go into detail on is the types of airframes you use, the types of sensors you use. There's a lot that goes into um, determining what you wanna do with UAS and what, what hardware platforms you're using, what airframes you're gonna be using. And so that all turns into what you can actually process with the data. I'm gonna cover these very briefly, just some of the pros and cons which you've already heard. So LIDAR, for example, uh, there's a lot of benefits that LIDAR brings, but there's also challenges with LIDAR. Currently, it's probably the most expensive platform to get. The data quality of LIDAR, depending on sensors, uh, allows for a lot more automated extraction of features, which we'll cover a little bit later. A higher quality point data, it can penetrate vegetation. So there's a lot of value in LIDAR that will help supplement that cost and make it more valuable in the processing side of things. Then some of the data we get, this is a version of one of our uh, pieces of data. LiDAR also can provide some uh, intensity spectrum that you don't get from photogrammetry or structure for motion, uh, additional data values that will allow you to actually include other processing types as, as part of that LiDAR data set. Photogrammetry, which in construction, design and surveying is probably the most common right now. Processing can be a little bit challenging. It's a higher technical skill set to, to manage your processing and to be able to understand how to process this data so that you can get what you want out of it. Things we talked about with uh, PPK processing, RTK processing, ground control points, how you apply those and how you use software to minimize your inefficiencies and, and inaccuracies is one of the challenges of photogrammetry. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. It's a lot lower cost than LiDAR. You can get into an airframe for fairly, any of the airframes that have a camera on them can be used for photogrammetry to varying degrees, but your sensor type um, and your, your flight parameters, those can affect the quality of data you can get out of those airframes, but generally far um, cheaper than LiDAR airframes. Then there's traditional just photo video, which I think, uh, Jake, I appreciated your view of that because there's a high value for just traditional photo and video in utility and and construction work as well. You can get high quality photos you can reference into other data sets that you don't need a complete point cloud or 3D terrain model or ortho photo, but they provide a lot of valuable context for, for detail and specific information that can be applied as well. Um, another challenge with photos and videos is managing the data. When you have a lot of photos and you're doing them project to project to project, and you're trying to maintain that as large part of a larger data set, it's important to think about how you're gonna manage that data how you reference it in, and we're gonna talk about some of those methodologies as well. 
this is probably the lowest cost, lowest bar for entry is photo video though. And so it allows us to just jump right into UAVs. One thing I think is important to note is that our utility, we do not have a drone program per se. We bootstrap this with, with nothing. We talked with Ryan years ago and asked for some free drone footage to try to test some processes out. And we've mostly made our way through this by asking for favors and help and using existing processes to help figure out how to do this. So a lot of these technical challenges to use the data are pretty significant, but the cost to do this is really um, not that much. And the return on investment we've seen is huge. In our survey program alone, we have about an 80% cost reduction in survey where we're using UAVs versus just traditional survey. And that includes with higher end deliverables and, and better long-term data. The other thing I want to talk about is other sensors. Uh, we've seen some infra infrared, there's multi-spectral cameras, SF6 detection. They're mounting methane detectors on UAVs and also they have started, I've seen some GPR applications of mounting GPR sensors on UAVs. I've been the chairperson for the Unmanned for Utilities Conference and a speaker for there in Atlanta where a lot of utilities come together to discuss the applications for drones. And sensors are getting smaller and more compact and better and more mobile and that fits very well in with the UAS space to actually include those in your data capture methods. Uh, data types and processing. So this is a fairly complicated uh, avenue and there's a lots of different elements to this. Photogrammetry processing, there are lots of different tools and it's important to look at those in the, in the view of how they fit in with your current design processes. Uh, point cloud management, so the deliverables you get from UAVs as well, whether it's ortho photos or mesh models or point clouds, how you manage those, how you classify data, there's lots of softwares that do that. I'll talk about a couple that we use. Data repositories is how are you going to store and manage this data? We have over um, 150 scans of underground electric vaults that we manage as part of our asset management system. Those aren't done with UAV, but part of our reality capture that is a deliverable similar, similar to UAVs. Uh, design tools, how are you going to use this when you start doing engineering design or analysis? How are you going to use those part of the review process? How do they fit into collaboration? And then what's the best way to disseminate this information to other departments or other people or other stakeholders? So I know I'm speaking quickly. I hope that's okay because I, I want to get to some of the more meat that I think you guys want. This is just talking a little about photos from US and how we use them. One, just top-down photos give you a great view of terrain and things that you might not typically see. But the best use that I've seen for photos is for inspection for additional context. I may have a 3D model of a pole, but if I can have uh, four photos at the top of that pole, I can determine attachment heights, I can clarify asset data, I can look for inconsistencies, I can look for problems with that pole of burned out insulators or issues with uh, conductors and attachments and failures in that pole. Those photos can give you a lot stronger visual confirmation of the data you're looking at in a point cloud or, or other data sources from UAVs. The same with the videos as well. Um, Ryan probably recognized this. I actually stole this from him. But this is just a video of a, of a tower. But using these to actually get a clarified view, when you're trying to replicate a structure using point clouds and trying to do information modeling, sometimes just being able to look at a picture to clarify what structures attach where and how that is built provides a lot of valuable context that you don't just get from a point cloud model as well. This is one of the challenges with photos and videos is screening and categorization. You need to identify up front what the relevant information is. So geographic location plays a huge part in how we manage photos in our system. And that means we need to know and categorize when they were taken, where they were taken, and how we're going to be using them. Also screening and organization. If I take 100 photos, how many of those are relevant? How are they valuable? How am I going to sort through them and screen them? So we use a screening process where we tag photos into some of our point clouds. So once we capture all those, we'll go through them and attach them into the data sets that we want. We'll attach them into GIS. So we pick the most relevant at the time that we want long-term usage of. And then we also categorize all those photos into a folder for that asset. So if we want to browse through that and look for other information at a future date, we can do that. But it takes some forethought and it's probably fairly different organization to organization. Uh, association to facilities. Um, Part of our reality capture program is to facilitate asset management. So I'm responsible for our GIS and our CAD operations and our engineering and our reality capture. So my goal is to help us have more valuable information in our GIS, which provides long-term viability for this information. I think a Harvard study done a, a little while ago talks about the one to 10 to 100 method in construction and asset management. 
where one hour spent in design saves 10 hours in construction and saves 100 hours over the life cycle of that asset. Reality capture can play a big role in providing a lot stronger information and data so that you're maintaining assets and maintaining information that be used long term. And that's the way that we look at it as well. So it's important to look at your data and how you're going to apply that. Orthographic imagery has, has played a huge role in our utility. This is one of the primary deliverables we use for surveying and engineering design. So we do a lot of data extraction from ortho imagery. And we also put these into a large model of our service territory that we use and update. So we have the most current imagery referenced in when we want to use it and when it applies to different project areas. And we use it to help validate stuff that maybe wasn't intended at the time of capture, uh, facility locations and terrain information to help with future design. So some of this has long-term viability of up to you know three or four years ahead. And this is what uh, I want to talk about how we use orthographic imagery. So this is kind of where the rubber meets the road is digitization of this stuff. What we do is we'll take orthographic photos from our drones and we will digitize those using our survey process. And I want to emphasize that one thing that we focus on at the capture time is survey control. So I always say control, control, control. However you gather this data, you want to do it in a method that allows you to have the best control and accuracy at the time of capture so that it can be reused and associated to other data sets. If I have all of my stuff with known survey control on similar coordinate systems, I can reference it into other designs, into vendor drawings, into our GIS very seamlessly. If you're not doing that, you spend a lot of time, one, checking your control, two, managing, translating that data into other coordinate systems or into other control sets, and then also verifying that that's been done correctly. So we do a lot of control effort on the front side. And one of the values of UAS and other reality capture methods is we've actually used terrestrial scanners to extract control from physical objects for ortho photos that we, we didn't have quality control for. So when you piggyback these data sets, you can get some additional value in referencing them together. Once we digitize from the ortho photo, we have a seamless overlay with our orthographic imagery and with our topographic civil CAD designs. You can digitize these in 2D or 3D. 2D is far faster. The three-dimensional method requires some of the point clouds and you have to do some post-processing of point clouds, which we'll talk about also. But the end product that we get, one, we get a lot more data than we used to get in a shorter amount of time. We can see a lot of things like uh, backyard areas where we might have encroachment issues or vegetation issues that would take a lot more time to physically survey. And so we get a lot of valuable information. And this is done in conjunction with traditional survey. Most of the time we'll get locates, underground utility locates. We do those manually because we try to capture when those are painted on the ground, but sometimes you won't be able to see those very well in the photos. So we tend to combine those processes. A lot of times you also get things that you might not see from the air, underground eaves or overhangs or thick vegetation areas that you might need to get additional context for. But it cuts down the amount of manual traditional surveying we do by about 80 to 90 percent. And it allows us to just stream on that process, but they work very well hand in hand. And it's important to evaluate these processes as you go. Each time we do a project, we evaluate what can we do better, what can we do different, what were the problems we had, and we try to update those processes to make them more streamlined and more accurate and provide better data. Uh, you can also extract terrain. This is something that's very valuable for us. This terrain model you're looking at is actually part of the L Street slide. So we had some undergrounding along this area, and the terrain played an important role. A lot of the soft, there's lots of softwares out there to automatically extract terrain. It takes some work in different point cloud softwares to make sure you're cutting vegetation and other features so that the terrain comes out correctly. But there's a huge value in automating some of these processes so that you don't spend a lot of time manually managing your terrain modeling. 3D mesh models, this is, depending on your applications, what you're using this for, a valuable tool for asset management and visualization. You'll see in this one, this is from um, a UAV, from an EB, and the side, the obliques of the buildings, we didn't capture those in this. So you see the mushiness of drone data on the obliques of those buildings. There, there's processes to fix that. It wasn't our main goal because we were looking at terrain and utility infrastructure on this one. But you can definitely see the differences in quality there. And the mesh model provides a lot more export options and functionality and streamlining into some other softwares that you might not get from point cloud data or traditional ortho photos. Uh, 
and this uh, point clouds and classified data, this is one of where a lot of the progress has been made in the last several years on processing data is the point cloud extract from UAVs is really high value to us because it gets all the three dimensional data you get. Now, processing point clouds of photogrammetry has more challenges. This is where the LIDAR data really shines because the quality of the data and the crispness of the data allow automated algorithms to, to do a better job of automatically extracting features. So this is automatic feature extraction where you can identify cars, buildings, vegetation, poles, overhead conductors, and you can build some of these algorithms out and, and tweak these to get better data processing. And the way we use that is we will run our classification and there's some other ways to do this to streamline this process, but a lot of this you need to pay attention to your point clouds. Don't just trust the data to work. We vet and look at and verify this. So we spend a lot of time assessing what our extraction has done and looking to make sure that it isn't just picking out a, a street light pole and, and classifying it as a car or a person. You know, we, we walk through this data and look at it and compare it to make sure that the extraction process is working well. But the feature extraction process is fairly successful. Once you have auto classified data in on some of the point cloud software, you can extract those individual classified points and apply them into other data sets and other softwares. And once you have classified the data, you can generate 3D features from those. And then those three dimensional features can be standalone objects. The goal with this is that point cloud data on its own is hard to use in engineering design. But once you convert that to actual 3D models, you can ass assign building information intelligence to those. So instead of just seeing a point cloud pole, I know that that's a, a class five 30 foot pole for distribution. And I can know what the cross arms are. And once I have that information, then I can do loading and analysis. And then I can also look at long-term planning design and I can put that into a maintenance program and know the age of this pole. But I'll have an accurate 3D model of it that I can get from point cloud data that I wouldn't normally be able to get. And the goal being that you, the more accurate your data can be, the more you can do with that data if you manage it well. Point lines and features. The challenge with a lot of point cloud data is actually extracting linear features. There's a lot of variation. But we've had some success in extracting, automatically extracting things like uh, road center lines, uh, curb and gutter, uh, asphalt pavement edge, building lines. A lot of those need vetting and checking, but when we run some of our extraction process, we get some good results and then we can export those into brake lines and update our terrain models and use those in Civil 3D for better engineering design. Uh, one thing that different softwares can do is extract the conductors. So we've had some success extracting overhead conductors from some LIDAR data that we have, and that allows us to check sag and tension and do better engineering analysis with that information. So point line of features are a critical part of the extraction process. This comes to data management. Once you start collecting data, uh, and I'm speaking from the part of utility, so not our, only are we a designer and a constructor, we're an asset manager. So we care not just about getting this into design and construction, but the long-term use of this data and how it impacts our asset management long-term. That really allows us to maximize the return on investment. So it takes some forethought to think what you wanna know about your assets and about your reality capture and about your UAS data. So geographic boundaries, locations, uh, the capture type, capture dates, uh, temperatures, time of days, related projects, you know, if, if I take an ortho photo of an area and it's tied to an engineering project, I probably want to link to that in the future to see what the context was of that construction, how it was used, and there may be additional things we've done with that data to facilitate that project that could be reused later. And so it's important to, to think through how you manage your data to reference it back to other data sets and to your UAS information. Large data sets. So I think we have close to three terabytes of captured data that are point clouds, photogrammetry from laser scans and from UAS data. Uh, so you need large data repositories. There's some really great things being done with cloud management right now to keep those in the cloud and that allows for sharing and also for uh, distribution to other places. But also that cloud management with software as a service allows you to not have to continue to maintain infrastructure in house and also provides you the ability to move that data uh, at different locations to apply it in different locations. So it takes a lot of effort too to make sure you're managing this well. Typically people start and they start dumping data in a project folder and then when it needs to be used down the road, it may be hard to find or hard to understand what was processed, what wasn't and how you're using it. So the data repositories, how you manage that organization has a big impact on the long-term use of this data as well. 
uh, now data integrations. This comes from really where we want to go is using this in a lot of other ways. I can speak to, there's lots of different applications that use point cloud data. Um, there's cloud applications for doing comparisons to 3D models. There is uh, any of your survey gear, survey equipment or survey companies like Leica or Trimble or Topcon, they do automated point cloud processing and feature extraction to different degrees. It's important to learn those softwares, but also to look at ones that work with your existing software packages. And those applications then, once you have a kind of a holistic approach of how data will move through your different applications and different departments, it allows you to get a lot more out of that data with a minimal effort in learning software or other applications. Might double up on my slides here, one second. So this gets into the, the processes of UAS data. So in what ways do you want to use UAS data? One thing that we found is we approach this a little bit backwards from most other companies. We started on the engineering side, which is actually a, a harder nut to crack because in operations, you can have inspections, you can replace someone in a bucket truck with a drone, you get an immediate return on investment. In engineering, you have to capture data, extract data, put it into an engineering process and make that useful in design. And that's where the challenge comes from. Uh, so I think that we have a, a little bit of a lag up as far as working through uh, some harder technical problems that allow us to leverage that, that would it make it easier to do it in some other departments. But what we've seen currently today from the other presenters is there's lots of variation in where this can be used. And it's important to look at when you gather data, when you process and store data, are you doing it in a way that might leverage it to other departments or other, other pieces of your, your utility or your company? And it's important to have those conversations with other stakeholders because then they can help facilitate better discussion on where and how that's used. And if they don't even know what's going on or aren't aware of those operations, it's hard for them to actually find additional benefit. And because most of this happens in a life cycle where maybe we do design and operations as construction, but whatever is built by our operations crew comes back to us in some form next time we touch that facility. So I have a vested interest in them using the data well and also providing back to me quality data so that when next time we use that, we can provide them a better product. So those life cycles are very important to look at uh, as an organization. Uh, this transition, give me one second. I might have doubled up on this one, but this is just a more detailed view of the value of, of data here. So reality capture and UAS fits into that category plays an important role in what we call virtual design and construction. The best way to get accurate 3D model as built is by having UAS data, LIDAR data, scan data, and then having a process to incorporate that into any part of the design process. And when you start with conceptual design, you, you can look at where this the best time to capture this data is and apply it earlier on in the process provides better long-term use of this data. Ryan's example of the um, the bridge they're working on on the 15 miles of remote road is, is a perfect example because if you have an original data set prior to any construction, you can capture additional data as you go, but you always have a comparison and that can be used in planning and conceptual design, which helps facilitate better detailed design. And that better detailed design can help facilitate better analysis, which helps better documentation, which helps with better construction. And the list goes on and on and on. And so the way that we use data really is, is the best marker for the ROI that we're going to get out of this. We look at this also as a utility, and this may not apply to everybody, but we have several different divisions. And I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but how are you going to share this data? Right now, we have a dispatch div division where they dispatch any electrical switching. Well, we have underground vault scans that can be very relevant to them. And so it's important that the, they have access to our data because they may be in an emergency situation where that data can help either um, provide them additional information to reduce outage times or even maybe help clarify something that might be dangerous. And I think the value of, of UAVs fits very well into the reality capture method of avoiding dangerous areas. You know, for our reality capture, we look at places where, where can we keep a body out of that might traditionally be dangerous? The top of a pole, inside of a confined space, uh, top-down aerial views of facilities that might take complicated equipment or, or or other systems to actually access by a person. And then how do we share that across different divisions and provide them the same benefits we get in engineering? And to be honest, this is uh, a challenging part of the process. In our generation division, we have some very 
uh, high quality point clouds of inside of our power plants, but we haven't actually got those fully into our process to make them more useful for the long-term management of those systems. We're working on that, but it takes a lot of effort and coordination with the stakeholders in that department to help them see the benefit and then have a process to utilize it. So it's an ongoing effort by us to reach out. We do a lot of evangelizing and talking in our utility to share this data with other people so they can see the benefit and so we can work together to provide better solutions. And sorry, my slide's a little slow. So that's one last thing I wanna talk about is where some of the technology is going with UAS and utilities. I work with, uh, I've talked with a lot of people at other utilities that are doing more advanced things with UAS. And some of the big benefits we're seeing are with uh, artificial intelligence and algorithms that do automatic maintenance recognition for photos. Pattern Analysis Electric Cooperative ha has an ongoing system they have for three years of pole inspections, where with a UAB, a single person can inspect 20 to 60 poles a day. They just plug those photos into a software called PLI that automatically sorts through a catalog of existing photos and will flag any type of maintenance issues, whether that's a burnt out conductor, a failed bolt, a cracked cross arm, a rotting pole, and then those are automatically flagged and go to someone for review and fit into their maintenance program. A place called NL Green Power, they do, uh, are a gigantic utility in Europe, but they have mostly a renewable energy presence in the US. On their solar farms right now, they have automated drone inspections using thermal imaging, imaging that will, uh, daily they fly their entire solar plants with a UAV and it flags hot spots or broken panels on drones using thermal imaging. And then that will just tie into their maintenance program and they'll send someone out instead of using a traditional inspector to go look at those each individually. So they've seen ROIs of orders of magnitude. And I think it's important to note that once you actually look at processing the data in a better way, the ROI goes from 20 to 30% to four or five times what it used to be. And I think that's really what excites me about the UAS industry is that um, not, not just kind of the cool tech of it, but how it supplements and works with other systems and programs that to facilitate better maintenance, better asset management, and that cost and time savings can be translated into safer, better practices and cost savings for our consumers. And that's really what I like about it. Uh, so that's my time and presentation. I really appreciate being part of this. Uh, thank you, Ryan. I hope I didn't speak too quickly. Uh, but no, I hope I really need to. Aaron, you got you got a lot in there and I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I, it's, it's definitely very interesting to see what you're doing and uh, um, thank you so much. Uh, now in lieu of time, I do have some questions for you, Aaron, but we'll save them for the question and answer. Um, so, uh, I'll jump on to our next presenter. Our next presenter is Amber McDonald with Indemnus. Uh, Amber, I see that you were still self-muted, but, um, yeah, I, uh, very excited to see what you have for us. There you go. Would you like can control you me, this slide as well? I can. Let me go ahead and give you keyboard control. All right. It's all you. Perfect. Well, thank you, Ryan, for giving us the opportunity to present. And thank you also to Troy and John and everyone within Alaska DOT. I know we've done a lot of work over the last year and um, have just been really energized with the focus from the state on UAS and all the fun projects that collectively all of our companies are doing to open up the industry. So Indemnis was born, we actually began under the film incentive and we were using drones for video production and we started as drone operators and from there realized that there needed to be a safety system on board to be able to fly overpopulated areas in the future. And so coming from the TV industry, we also, you know, we were we we started with the joke that you wouldn't want to fly a drone over Tom Cruise's head without protecting him. So um, Indemnis is now the seatbelt for the sky. We create drone parachutes. We're based here in Anchorage, Alaska. We design and manufacture in our facility right off Lake Otis and Dowling. Um, and it's been an interesting journey going from operator to learning how to navigate the regulatory process. It's definitely something that we never thought we'd see ourselves in, but has been one of the funnest projects that we have all ever done. So. Um, do I have the ability? I cannot control it, Ryan. Bottom left. Oh, stay off of my screen. Let me see. You should be able just to click on it. There you go. Sweet, there we go. Oh, I have no sound. That's okay. Um, yeah, so like I said, 
indebtedness uh, were developed for safe flight over people. And we launch a parachute with this inflatable tube right here. And that in tube deploys and becomes rigid so that it becomes an extension of the airframe. With that, it removes the parachute lines outside of the roll radius and prevents any entanglement. Um, so that has been the sort of special sauce that has allowed us to create our systems. Let me see. There's another image here shortly. We'll just watch the video. It's a little choppy. Perfect. Um, so as many of you know, it's illegal to fly commercial drones over populated areas under 107. And that's because the FAA and other civil aviation authorities know that realistically, if a 15 pound mass or even a 10 pound mass falls out of the sky, that's not just gonna hurt someone if it hits it, it's most likely going to be a lethal injury. And that's not a risk that the public should have to accept. So Indemnis has, taken on, I guess, the task of doing human injury. We've crashed drones and studied them, um, crashed them into ATDs, cadavers, worked with the Assure test sites, the University of Huntsville, Alabama, um, NIAR with the University of Wichita, and been able to really sort of find the sweet spot as far as weight and material composition as to what is safe to fly over people and what it is not safe. Um, with that, we are the only approved system in the world for commercial drones. We have created systems all the way up to 55 pounds that um, we can bring down safely. And here is a little bit on the technical perspective to sort of break it down, like you saw in the video. So in its compressed state, it's a about a 12 inch capsule that attaches to the drone. And in the event of a deployment, that air tube right here, it inflates extremely rapidly, throws the parachute at 140 miles an hour. This becomes a rigid apparatus and a steel extension of the airframe. And then the attachment point of the parachute is now outside of the roll radius at all times. So because it's rigidly attached here, when the drone is rolling and tumbling, it's always staying outside of the rotors and other control surfaces that it can entangle with. And that is how the parachute is able to open up properly every time. With that, um, we worked hand in hand with the FAA um, and lots of industry partners, DJI, Intel, um, Precision Hawk. I'm trying to think of all the people that were on the committee. We went through the process on an ASTM committee to approve a standard. It's titled F3322-18. Um, and it is the standard that allows for validation and certification of parachutes on drones. That standard has allowed us to open doors and be able to empirically prove that a drone can be operated over a human um, and with a parachute come down at a level of kinetic energy that is safe if it, if it does impact a person. This, is, this tube is a patented technology and um, we do have a proprietary fall detection software. So it is autonomous. In the event of a failure, it does detect and deploy on its own. So it's a huge industry. We all know that in order to fly over populated areas, there needs to be a safety system or um, other ways of mitigating it. Or also, you know, you have CNN who has the snap drone with material composition. It's a, a light drone that falls apart. And then um, pre-planned routes and other things. There are other competing, definitely products on the market. There's ParaZero who you may have heard of. There's also SkyCat and Mars. Um, Indemnis is the only, turnkey solution that is scalable all the way up to 55 pounds and is ASTM certified. It's our job to protect life and property on the ground. Um, we get to do some really cool things. We have a partnership with Uber and have actually engineered and integrated in since day one for the Uber Eats drone. Um, actually right here in Alaska, we have tested their drone been able to deploy it. 
um, and go through that process. So that's been pretty exciting. We also are the only company that has a safety partnership with DJI. A lot of the previous presentations, and I'm sure a lot of the um, operators are very familiar with DJI. And um, we have worked hand in hand with them to develop the technology, engineer it so that it integrates well with their platforms. And we're the only company that is trusted by DJI and has partnered with them. And then DSM Dyneema is the material that we use. They're based out of the Netherlands um, and we have a partnership with them as well. For those that are familiar with the um, upcoming streamline type certification process, we're taking the FAA's crawl, walk, run, fly approach and working to obtain ASTM certification, integrate in and really support our clients through the durability and reliability process. So for those that um, are looking to carry heavier payloads or scale up to the larger weight drones outside of the DJI suite, um, we'd love to work with any clients on that as well. We are going through the process and doing the testing hours now. So we are also working on a platform that can be purchased off the shelf for delivery or um, you know, search and rescue applications, public safety, things like that. Just bringing a little innovation back to Alaska, we have lots of earned media over the years we and we have a experienced team that is all actually based here in alaska and from alaska with that i mean the highlights of our product we have an upcoming m300 coming out for those that are looking to make the switch and are interested in doing different projects with the larger platforms um, that will be integrated in and available we are extremely excited to take something from an innovation standpoint to develop and test within Alaska. We would love for you guys to join us, to be a part of any projects that you have. Um, I can connect you with our team that takes on sort of the regulatory process for those that have COAs that they'd like to submit utilizing our product. And we would be absolutely on board to help push the industry forward and open doors for everybody that might be interested. So thank you, Ryan. Excellent, Amber, and thank you so much. It's it's fantastic showing some of the innovation that's happening here in Alaska and um, and what you guys are working on and some of the homegrown items. So, uh, and with that, uh, I bring in our next presenter, um, Nick Adkins. Um, he is with the Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration. And uh, let me go ahead and make sure, Nick, you are unmuted. Um, yep, there we go. And I will, uh, you want me to switch over or you want me to help you through? I think I might be able to click through the slides on yours. All right, let me uh, let me switch over control. All right, it's all you. Okay, uh, as Ryan said, I'm Nick Adkins and I am, uh, to, well, I guess it's not gonna go, Ryan. Uh, let me give it a shot, the bottom left right there. All right. There we go. Uh, and I'm the Director of Operations for AQUASI. AQUASI is a long acronym for um, Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integrations. And our basic function is um, multiple research projects, and we are trying to safely integrate unmanned aircraft into the NAS. I'm going to try again. Next slide, please. All right. Sorry, thrown off a little bit by that. And then just following all these presentations, I mean, that's that's some amazing stuff happening. So I've been uh, thoroughly interested in listening to the previous ones. It's amazing stuff happening in Alaska and everywhere else. Um, here's here's who we are. We work with, we're, we are an FAA test site. Um, we um, constantly, can you go to the next slide for me or tell me how to use this? Because it's not working like it did the other day. It's right now. And next slide. All right. I think I was too fast. Can you one go one up more one? Back. Yeah. Coming back. Okay. So the Alaska Center for U.S. Integration is an FAA test site. So we're an actual, you know, designated test site. We got that uh, some time ago now. And then we are part of the FAA Center of Excellence uh, that works with uh, all the safety integration. 
and then the FAA integration pilot program, which is, uh, you know, the executive order to get unmanned aircraft into the airspace, which is being carried on um, after October. Uh, the actual name of it hasn't been decided, but we are going to be able to stay involved in that. So we're really excited about that because we've made quite a bit of traction through that program. Uh, and as a quasi, uh, the Department of Transportation from Alaska, they got behind us on this integration pilot program. So we're very grateful for them in the first place for doing that because the majority of the, you know, they're, it's not a university for the most of the players. And there was uh, like 250 applicants uh, of which 10 were selected were one of the 10, there's only nine left. And we still get to continue that participation on the, uh, the next events. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, who we are. Uh, so like myself, I'm a retired Army um, Chinook helicopter pilot, instructor pilot, and then I started inspecting unmanned units in the Army. That's where I really got into the unmanned world, uh, and then I was thoroughly interested in it. And then the University of Alaska and Dr. Kathy Cahill decided to hire me and bring me on board, and I've been having a blast ever since because we are obnoxious enough to think we're going to actually have some the ability to change the FAA, um, help them with integrating unmanned aircraft safely into the airspace. Uh, so along with me and other veterans, uh, a couple warrant officers, a few folks that flew thousands of hours unmanned aircraft on uh, predators and other large systems, we have science and engineering faculty, staff, and students. And they all play a role to include helping build different aircraft or teaching, um, tricking kids into learning, uh, from our engineers and our science, just amazing things that are going on. And it's really cool to see the dynamic of the folks that are in the room. So you've got, you know, everyone from this professor who's been working on this one project that, you know, you never really thought they had anything to do with it. They started out working in air, air sampling like our, our boss did. And the next thing you know, she's hanging that sensor off of an unmanned aircraft and she becomes the lead for a quasi. Um, one of the differences and one of the reasons I think we get a lot of our permissions is all of our pilots, every single one of them, is a manned pilot, a minimum of at least a private pilot. What that allows us to do is understand the airspace. Um, depending on the project we have to work, uh, we have all the way up to um, commercial instrument rated pilots. And depending on the COA or the permissions from the FAA or a contract that somebody might provide us, we'll determine what, we, what level of training the person needs. We also brought in our own air crane and power plant mechanic because we need to maintain these aircraft the same way or at least as close to the same way as manned aviation because that aircraft in that picture there that's that's a 16 foot wingspan twin engine airplane weighs about 300 pounds and it's a little bit strange because that person there is literally seven foot two he's a very very tall person so it's a much larger aircraft than what it looks like in the picture we also have our own fa whisperer tom he is our retired fa air traffic control flight service specialist and that's one of the one of our great benefits too is he's able to speak FAA. We have a business developer and we have embedded contractors. Uh, the embedded contractors is mainly because we, the university can't move at the speed of business. So through our contractor, we're able to execute things as needed to work with private industry and business. Next slide, please. Okay, here's some of our fleet um, in the, uh, we use some DJI products every once in a while, but mostly for PR um, and training Training folks that use them in different departments will help with that. But the DJI um, products are not used on, on many of our, our projects these days. Those are, um, they're phenomenal tools and they're being used amazing. And, you know, like you saw earlier in some of the other credit invitation, I'm very excited about what Alaska, uh, you know, Anchorage PD is doing um, the presentation from Utah. That is phenomenal stuff where they're using amazing machines. Um, down below that, we've got our Sea Hunter. That's the twin engine airplane you see there. That has just returned to Texas. It's staying in Texas to get some more maintenance, but it just got done working in Gas Bay, Canada. Um, what is really cool, we'll, we'll find out later, is some of the things that it did this year. We have some updates from last year on this slideshow, and then I would love to get the new information out, but I mean, it just got home, but we have actual AI happening on board real time in that aircraft right there. You move over to the right from that one, that's our responder helicopter. That thing has done work um, and it, that's an under 55 pounds, whereas the Sea Hunter, that's, that's about 300 pounds. 
the responder helicopter has done work like in, it has mapped Islet Glacier. It's actually a touchable model in the National Park Service down there in Seward. Um, we go to the bottom left corner. That's our perimeter four. That's a picture of the perimeter four. A perimeter eight version made by Skyfront is uh, you're going to have eight motors instead of the four. That's a gas hybrid electric machine. That's going to become our 135 operation with our embedded contractor, Unmanned Systems Alaska. Uh, it's going to start by delivering um, supplies, medical uh, utensils is one of the words they use. Basically, it's scalpels, and they get sanitized back at Fairbanks Memorial Hospital. And we're going to fly them from Tanana Valley Clinic, if you're familiar with Fairbanks at all, um, about a mile from rooftop to the heliport at FMH. And that's that's the basics of it. And with that, we're doing plenty of, uh, you know, the airspace research has been done so that we can figure out what is in that area. Uh, some of the advantages of being right there is they have radar pretty much all the way to the ground there because we're in uh, the class Delta airspace of Fairbanks. That is an ongoing project. And that perimeter eight aircraft is going to be certified to do that mission. So that's the 135 operation. And the hopefully the kind of a catalyst that's going to start real cargo delivery happening here in Alaska where we need it to happen. Then we move over to the bottom right. That's our century. That's a DRS century. And there's about $25 million worth of equipment that came with those aircraft. We have 10 of them, but they kind of shut the assembly line off. So we've, we've got four of them that are absolutely flyable and another two that could be made flyable. Um, we, are, we plan to use those for, because they can carry quite a bit of a payload. That's a 12 foot wingspan, weighs up to 400 pounds, can carry about a hundred pound payload if needed. Um, it actually has a recovery system of a parachute. Uh, it's a it's an impressive machine, and we really can't wait to get it to work. Um, COVID put a few things off that were supposed to happen this summer, like has happened to everyone else, I'm sure. Next slide, please. Okay, up at uh, Kapark, we were able to use the Sea Hunter and fly beyond visual line of sight with a chase plane. So it, it was in line of sight with the chase plane, but the machine and our, and our ground troop crew was, was showing, you know, what it could do. Uh, the other side of this is, is some of the, I don't know if arguments is the word, discussions that we have with the FAA are things like, um, if you guys are familiar with Kapark up there flying out over the ocean, there's, there's nobody really out there. Um, and we wanted to do this without a chase plane, but FAA doesn't really have a, a mechanism, if you will, to fly an unmanned aircraft like that without a chase plane. And then we had an additional safety, the because they were beyond glide distance of the airport or, or land. And if you know an airplane goes down out there, there's there's no help. Uh, even if it lands on the water and they're they're alive in the plane, it still could be you know really just they're they're probably not making it. The water's so cold. So we decided to have a twin engine airplane chase the aircraft. Um, we still got a lot of value out of it, got the work done, but they. And we were able to show them, this is kind of, this is a year and a half ago. We were able to show them that, you know, the likelihood of encountering another aircraft is very slim, but the danger of the chase plane could could actually increase the, the risk. Um, that, that was our perspective, of course. Um, now the FAA is starting to look at how do we present a real case of where an unmanned aircraft is actually safer to be out there by itself, as opposed to putting another aircraft behind it in danger. Um, so those discussions are beginning. We're very happy about that. And I think this is part of the reason that came about. Next slide, please. Um, here is, and I love it. Here's what I like to do. And it's, it's, what do we got? I think it tells us how many folks we have in here. We got uh, a few folks still on. Uh, basically, 68. I don't know if anybody has heard about this operation in Canada. Um, well, basically, it went very well in Inuvik. And we were able to operate right on an airfield and we operated beyond visual line of sight without a chase plane. Uh, it can be done, it is normal. There was no explosions, everybody was fine. Next slide, please. Okay, here's just some of the routes and we were looking for the, specifically the North Atlantic right whales, which are endangered. There's about 400 of them left. Um, the, the gas bay there is what happens, the, they transport the ships back and forth through there. If those whales are seen, they have to come to a crawl with those ships, which incurs cost, time. It's all, all of it is an issue. So they don't really want to slow down unless they need to. Um, and 
when we compete against animal counting, looking for whales, any, any of those type of projects, we're competing against a person in an airplane with a notebook, a clipboard a lot of times. So being able to actually identify them automatically from the aircraft in real time is, is phenomenal. Uh, the first year that we did it, we were not allowed to, they were not allowed to use our data as decision making as to whether or not the ships were uh, to slow down. Uh, but they were kind of looking over the shoulder of the data that we were providing. And this was before our AI was done. This year, we have captured images with AI and reported back uh, immediately. If it's within the radio line of sight of our 900 link, then we get a JPEG, JPEG picture of that to determine if it's an actual right whale. So we're not quite to the completed PowerPoint that a lot of people, I think, expect from a drone, but we're getting closer. And then if it's beyond the radio line of sight and we're working over the iridium, it sends a basically a text of a location that triggered in the AI. And that AI is telling us that, hey, we've spotted a whale and it knows whether or not it's a right whale or something else. Next slide, please. Um, for Department of Transportation folks, I think you'll be interested in this. And uh, if you have more questions about this, I would I would love to let you know about it. They did the um, they did the um, Nuvik Highway, and it was AL went through. AL is one of our um, we lovingly call them one of our nerds. It takes all the because we we somebody else already mentioned this. We produce massive amounts of data and collect huge amounts of data, and then that data has to be made into something useful. It's actually almost more of a project to make the useful information out of all that data than it is to actually fly the machine. So with all of that data, they were able to capture and map all of all of the sections of the highway that they needed. Uh, we are still pulling that together. One of the goals is to try and make one big piece out of it. But this is this is like frontline brand new stuff that has never been done. It's it's a huge the the amount of data that has come in from this project is unreal. We had to rebuild the cameras, for example. Next slide, please. Okay, here is, this is AI spotted whales uh, that was captured. Um, and you can see some of the altitudes that they're captured at from 2,000 to 4,000 feet, depending on where it is. They're detecting them submerged. Um, for those of you, a lot of you have mentioned working with data before, you, you understand how difficult this is to have happen, especially when it's submerged underwater like that. Um, they were able to determine what the whale was, and the AI was able to sort that out. Now, this was not on board from last year. This was previous to the package that we went out there with this year with Plank Arrow, and now those images are coming back from the aircraft in real time AI detected on board with the aircraft. Next slide, please. Okay, there's some of our numbers. Uh, we are collecting massive amounts of data. We love having that picture with the airplane with that uh, maple leaf on there. And of course, we give the FAA a hard time because you know we're flying an unmanned aircraft beyond visual line of sight with the Canadian government. Um, and we, we poke fun at them. We do. We have we have a good time. But I do want to mention the FAA has. It's a drastic difference from when I started really working with unmanned aircraft in around 2015 to today. It's been a massive difference. We have the right people in the room for the FAA trying to make a, a change so that we can actually use these unmanned aircraft of all forms, whether they're smalls or all the way up to the, you know, 7,500 pound machines, then we're going to be able to hopefully use these. And I think we're going to see cargo delivery here in Alaska first. That's that's my prediction. We'll find out if I'm correct. Next slide. So. Obviously, some of the folks we've been working with, we do want to work more with Ryan. We're, we're grateful for him being there with our, uh, you know, airports because we want to fly off of Fairbanks International. One of the things that we've been proposing, we're talking to the FAA, very initial um, conversations, and it'll be part of what is the next iteration of IPP is a, a the ability to fly from Fairbanks International to somewhere like Nanana. And the reason we're picking that is because you guys know that up here in Alaska, we don't have very many roads, but to prove a system works, those teams have to get to both sides and, and make sure things are going the way they're supposed to, to test it, to prove it, to show the FAA that we can do this safely with a small, large, medium, whatever class unmanned aircraft we're talking about. So we wanna start there. And then we start working into delivering to Galena or 
Port Yukon and, and on, and because we have a real problem with cargo here in the sense of 135 operations, uh, the people take priority. So we have cargo backed up on a regular basis. Throw COVID into the mix, we've got more cargo backed up. So there is this case for the drone coming to your house uh, and, and folks are working on that. But up here in Alaska, I think we think that the real issue is, you know, diapers to a village. So next. Okay, DAA, this term, if you haven't heard this yet, DAA is detect and avoid. It is, it is what is discussed at just about every one of our meetings with the FAA. And we are one of the agencies that's testing it along with other schools, other, uh, other folks. Um, some of the folks that have already spoken, they've been involved with this some. Um, IRIS is one of our partners. Echodyne is the ground-based and an air-based system radar. Um, there's sonar, there's you name the way to look for another aircraft and somebody's trying to make that work. They're also working within systems that already exist in manned aviation and pulling that into unmanned. What we're doing is we're setting up scenarios and when I say scenarios, picture just a, a blanket test. This aircraft is gonna fly through this area, whether that's a helicopter or an airplane, and we're gonna make sure that the IRIS or Echodyne or whoever they, whoever the player is, their machine is actually detecting it and then determining that it's in the right place. And then now does that aircraft, or the unmanned aircraft, does it avoid like it's supposed to? Whether that's information to a pilot controlling it on the ground or whether that's an automatic avoiding system talking to the autopilot. We're testing kind of all of those pieces and then we give that information back to the FAA. Um, and then part of that is figuring out what the FAA wants to see, like what is the standard for seeing a void for an unmanned aircraft when um, right now you kind of picture, it, it's gotten a little better, but there's like this 360 around it. And in manned aviation, if I'm flying in a Cherokee and somebody else is flying in a twin Comanche and is going faster, I can't see them behind me. They have to avoid me. Um, is it reasonable to ask an unmanned aircraft to only look forward? Um, those are, you know, those are questions and we're trying to answer those or help answer those. Because um, seeing everywhere above, below, behind uh, 360 is difficult, and radar has been the best answer. Next slide, please. Okay, so this picture, um, I'm the guy in the blue in the center with the beard, so you guys have a reference of who's talking to you if you don't know me. Kathy is in the green dress with the uh, white hat coming down over eyes, uh, the hard hat coming over her eyes a little bit. And then we have, if you see all those FAA folks, um, and then we have Alieska right there. That was our beyond visual line of sight that we accomplished on July 31st, 2019. We still have the waiver. We're the only one in the country with the waiver with the part 3133 uh, waiver on 107. We did this with the Perimeter 4 aircraft, which is uh, they're sitting by right now with Skyfront actually operating at the time. And then our engineers working with Echodyne placed ground radar along the pipeline to see not only our aircraft in the air, but to see the area around the aircraft so we could stay within the remain clear of general aviation, manned aviation, and, and see what's in the airspace. And when I say see, we were watching on the radar screen. And we flew that after proving it, we got into the ground control station with FAA members in there working as a team. That was kind of strange because normally uh, there's probably more pilots in the room. We kind of avoid the FAA. We had them right there with us and we watched it on the screen. There was not an actual observer outside and flew a whopping almost four miles. And we're very, very happy for that because we stayed at 400 feet coming down that hill and then back up the hill the other side, 400 feet above the pipeline. Um, and now we're able to use that. And we actually have 20 mile section of uh, the, the taps where we can do beyond visual line of sight work, provided we have the ground-based radar in place. And that's one of, you know, we're very happy that we have that. We're very thankful we get to test with it. So that was a that was a big deal for Alaska. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now we get to tell folks. Uh, I didn't put a video in here, but if you guys look up Facebook Aquila, we were able to operate that machine. It's an aircraft that was designed to have solar panels and fly around 60 to somewhere between 30 and 90,000 feet. It would climb up in the daytime. And then it would, uh, during the night, it would descend and then the sun would come back up and it would go back up again and then it would transmit internet, internet across. 
and then it, the next slide will kind of show the next iterations of this not working with facebook as much but next slide please so the half is about 250 foot wingspan and it's going to fly um in those altitudes and then it's going to circle similar it's going to have solar power and the folks that are doing this are i mean it's just amazing this is exciting stuff you guys have seen massive use of uh that small unmanned aircraft that's kind of in the toolbox of the person on the ground and then now you just take that kind of thing and just expand it to where we can actually deliver you know massive amounts of cargo we can we can provide internet uh, think of it as low flying satellites so you can get better imagery i mean the list goes on and on i'm really happy that the fa we they even have a drones for good is coming out and it has been one of the things they've been mentioning so i feel like when we say drones it doesn't have the negative meaning that it has had in the past so we're thankful for those things too and i think that's it next slide please all right back to you ryan well thank you nick uh, i actually do have a couple questions um it looks like uh anna boston oh let me mute you um looks like anna boston has a question what is the relationship of a quasi with other uaf drone type research groups with other drone type research groups such as the universities that we work with on a regular basis i'm i'm not a. let's see anna if you could raise your hand i'll go ahead and unmute you so you can uh Oh, there I can go right there. Perfect. All right, Anna, you should be live. Thanks, Nick um, and Ryan. I, I've i uh, heard of Gina at UAF, which is some other research group that I think we are working on with um, with Troy Hicks from DOT. Yep. And yeah, I, wonder, I talked to Troy earlier this week, actually. Yeah, and I guess I always find out there's other research groups that are using drones at UAF. So I just didn't know what the relationship was um, with the quasi and other researchers or, or research groups. Most of the projects uh, from the, it, if it's within the university, we usually, as a quasi, we usually at least know about it. Um, and then depending on the level of what that is, because a, a lot of these things have taken the shape of, it is a tool for a professor or a researcher or or that line person to have in their toolbox and then we don't have uh the authority as the unit well the university does but a quasi doesn't we're a department in the university right um so we're happy to help folks learn how to use a drone correctly um keep it safe uh keep it within 107 regulations or or however they may be flying because we have some university researchers they have uh coas and they do you know all kinds of work they've been working on drones for years um troy um with dot has been developing how to use the data from a drone for for quite a while and he's he's doing amazing work and he's in our, you know they're actual surveyors so they're turning in this you know epic information that we're looking forward to getting back from him with dji dji rtk drones so that's one of the projects we're working on with him and our role as a quasi because gene is involved too right they're they're giving them information on the the back end processing whereas a quasi we're going to help the 107 operators that work for him understand how to get permissions to do you know extended visual line of sight when they can do things with a drone versus when they should you know kind of pack up and not not use the drone so that's kind of our role kind of really get into depth of what their 107 means to have that 107 certificate and where they need to ask for further permissions. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for that clarification. And Nick, thank you for that. Uh, and with that, we uh, we have 10 minutes left in our peer exchange. So what I really wanna do is open up to uh, any attendees that have questions and uh, open up the floor to our panelists. Um, uh, if, if we don't have any questions, if you could please just raise your hand and uh, we can we can unmute you. Otherwise, uh, we will jump into uh, some of the questions that I have for the panelists as well. So I'll keep a lookout for your hands raised. But uh, with that, we'll jump into our first question. Uh, and this is open for all panelists. Hopefully you guys are. Uh, yep. Nope. Never, uh, let me go ahead and unmute everyone. Um, what are the biggest challenges with UAS at the moment?
So this is Aaron Mason. I can speak to our organization. We've had a challenge getting understanding from some of the stakeholders to actually invest in time and money. We've had to do most of what we've done without a really significant buy-in from management. It's been kind of token. And the way we've done that is by finding uh, either software companies that we've worked with or uh, other partners in the, in the community to help prove out workflows and things, but just people not really understanding what they can do with it. And then also uh, there's a lot of flashy stuff you see online about people doing things with drones. And I've talked with a lot of people who see that and they attempt to get into it. And when they can't necessarily get the deliverables that they, that they see presented, that that's, there's not an easy path to that, it discourages some people. And so I think of the education side of it and understanding really what, what it takes to get um, useful data and, and useful deliverables out of it has been a challenge. Absolutely. So, so not, uh, not basically reading the brochure and, and really getting more of the hands-on with it and, and how it integrates with your, uh, your operations. Uh, anybody else have anything to add in on that? I'd just like to add that that's been a, a primary so when we have a new customer, sorry, this is Nick, by the way, and when we have a new customer, they, they really do, I joke about it, but they kind of expect this PowerPoint decision brief done, and they're not getting that from manned aviation right now, but you show them a 300 pound aircraft and they expect to have it. So it's it's almost um, entertaining. And then the, the, the expectation of, they think a drone is expensive, but they don't realize how much a camera costs, let alone the aircraft and everything else that will carry the camera. So those are some of the challenges I think people need to be aware of. <laughs> it's not gonna give you more than in a manned aircraft right now. It's gonna give you great data, and in some small areas, it'll give you more, but not in general. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and building upon that too, one of the big items that we've seen is, is just uh, you see the fancy brochure, and um, but getting training for our, for our departments and, and, and really connecting those resources on how to operate those systems safely. And, and you saw the photos from Nick, the teams required to, to test those systems. And, and really that takes us into our next question of um, what are the next steps with UAS to enable true beyond visual line of sight? Try and take that if you want, Ryan. Go for it. So, without a a detect and avoid system, there's a couple. So we got to have a detect and avoid system. That's that's kind of a given. Um, with that detect and avoid system, it, it has to be proven and meet a standard that the FAA will eventually set through ATS, ASTM and other organizations. Now you have to also go back to you know, 91.113 says see and avoid. There's not really a place in the FAA for a computer to see something. So you, you can't have a DAA over here from a computer working in a system that doesn't recognize a computer can see and avoid something. So there's there's changes that need to happen on, you know, manned aviation needs to understand that they don't own the airspace solely. Unmanned aviation and the, and the folks building the products need to realize that all of these regulations were written in blood at some time. So, you know, if you want to go interact in the national airspace, you, you need to get familiar with these and try and meet everything you can. And then the FAA is going to have to understand that they're going to have to realize that a computer may actually beat a person in an aircraft or an observer on the ground, which has been proven in the past. And they're going to have to rely on that. And that that's a big ask of the FAA to rely on a computer, if you will. My thoughts. Absolutely. This is Aaron Mason. I can piggyback on that a little bit. Some of the work we've done with other utilities, especially working, I think, with North Dakota and some of the other test sites out there, is they've got some kind of test BB loss operations for long line, transmission line, remote operations type of thing. And I think some of that low hanging fruit gives them the opportunity to prove out the value of BB loss. So they're doing some, you know, 50 mile transmission line inspections with uh, BB loss temporary waivers and things that allow us to see the technology moving forward, but we're gonna to have to get more people aware of what those are, to get more community buy-in, to kind of push those forward so the FAA kind of just help help motivate. I think they're I think they're trying, you know, I think there's a, a lot of effort going on there, but it's such a big industry and such a dynamic change that the more we can prove out the value of these, I think the better leverage we'll get to improve those things. Absolutely, and and kind of one thing that Nick had touched on earlier was the using the uh, using the Arctic as a test bed. You know, we we happen to have the largest. I think we're at 2.5 million square miles of airspace 
uh, and a lot of that goes unused. So really it, using what we have here in Alaska, which is a lot of airspace and, and a lot of great you know, UAS technology and really uh, reaching out to FAA to make that happen um, and, and set up those, those test, test cases. You know, we have one thing that we've, we're definitely looking at with UAF is uh, with, with some of the uh, pandemic is how do we get out to these communities and airports that have asked for no one to visit uh, and document those runways, document that infrastructure. And so using unmanned aircraft uh, is definitely a, a, an option that we're looking at. And, 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 but before we can do that, we really need to figure out the, the basics and on how we enable the on visual line of sight. Well, thank you guys for that. Uh, I did have a question from Ryan Quigley here, uh, and it looks like I'll be answering this one. It says, I, I don't have a mic, but I was wondering if DOT has been looking into implementing a regular imagery capture program along department corridors. 2D imagery rather than 3D imagery, is that too big of a task for the hardware, software, storage, distribution systems that we have? Ryan, to answer your question, um, we actually have a group in Northern Region right now. It's uh, Christine Langley's group is really documenting the, the use of AR, VR uh, and tying it in with unmanned air, uh, imagery. I believe uh, Brandy that's on here as well uh, is part of that group, but um, they are kind of looking at that exact workflow and kind of showing like what Aaron had been working on, um, the ability to tie all those together and, and really be able to visualize that, that reality capture and, and the visualization of those projects through InfraWorks and, and even using uh, augmented reality headsets or viewing platforms out in the field. So um, if that answers your question, otherwise I'll shoot you uh, Christine's contact so you can uh, reach out to her. All right, our next question, and probably the most important one, what is one piece of practical advice you would give to someone starting out with UAS? Can I answer that one, Ryan? Go for it, Jake. I was actually gonna put it on you. <laughs> I was gonna say, I think probably the best thing you can do is, first off, read up on, on what you can and can't do with drones, because I see a lot of people go down to Best Buy, buy a $1,000 drone, and then go immediately do something they shouldn't be doing with it. Um, that And uh, honestly, there is a lot of fantastic resource on YouTube to going and finding out what you can and can't do as a hobbyist or even as a Part 107 holder uh, with your drone. But the next best thing is go find a very large, wide open field and slowly practice flying it around in a space where there's nobody else, there's no property that you could damage, um, and you know, you're not in illegal airspace. So that you can learn the way uh, learn the way the drone flies and learn how it responds to your controls and take your time doing that. That's what I usually tell people to do whenever they ask me that question on my YouTube videos is like, please go find a wide open space, take your time and learn to fly the drone, just fly it around slowly for a while until you get the feel and build the skills, the muscle memory and the skills to know what you're seeing the drone do and how it will respond to the stick inputs is really important. But doing it in a wide open space is really important. It'll save you money. Absolutely. Yeah, those practical flight skills. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I've definitely crashed everything I've ever flown, uh, mostly because I built them myself. So, uh, but yeah, figuring out how it operates and, and uh, just understanding the flight parameters of what that aircraft can actually do. Um, let's see, anybody else wants to jump in? Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, this, is, this is Aaron. I think I want to piggyback on Jake and that just flying it manually, but also if you're doing automated workflows for photogrammetry by programming in flight paths, do that also in open field first. Understand your software and, and play with those settings in a place where you're, you're not going to have an issue with it so that when you get out there to fly an automatically programmed flight, you understand what it's going to do for overlap and height and those type of things so that you're not surprised by something. Absolutely. Well, and with that... Oh, go ahead, Nick. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is most drones that are lost is still pilot error. That is our biggest error causing thing because they don't understand the system like they, like they were mentioning. So if you can get your hands on like real flight simulator to learn your thumb maneuvers and then really understand what you're asking the aircraft to do when you put it in that auto feature because it might not see something else when it's on the auto feature, um, that'll save you a lot. Absolutely. Well, hey, I wanna thank all of you guys for attending here today. I really appreciate your time and all of the valuable insight uh, with what's going on here in Alaska as well as the nation. Uh, I do wanna have you uh, mark your calendars for our episode two taking place on September 29th. 
same time, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. But thank you guys very much, and uh, we'll see you at our next uh, peer exchange.